What's going on there, YouTube? Welcome back to another comic book video. Okay, so we're going to do a full story video. A full story video is when I sit down and take a bunch of videos that tell one overarching story and combine them together into one big video. Now, today's full story video is going to be about the New Mutants. You see, at the tail end of the original series, Cable arrived. When he arrived, it began the process of us seeing the new mutants no longer be the team that we knew and loved. Instead, we begin to see the team transform into X-Force. And so these are the final stories of the original series that began the process of bringing us X-Force being led by Cable. I do hope you enjoy. What's going on there, YouTube, and welcome back to another comic book video. Okay, so we are going to continue our coverage over X-Men comics as we work our way up to Days of Future Present, the next crossover that we are going to talk about. But first, we got to jump back over to New Mutants and cover a three-part story arc that takes place in New Mutants number 87, 88, and 89. This three-part story arc is going to bring in Cable, but also give us our first appearance of Strife as well. And also, this is the point where you have Cable beginning the process of taking over the new mutant team and turning into X-Force down the road. And so guys, I do hope you enjoy today's video. And so getting into the opening pages for today's video, we actually pick up with the Mutant Liberation Front. Now, this is not our first time talking about this team. We had actually saw them at the end of our last video. And remember, they said that they were going to attack different government facilities until the government releases Skid and Firefist. Now remember, in our last video, Skid and Firefist got arrested by Freedom Force. And so because Freedom Force works for the government, you had his team saying, we are going to constantly attack different facilities that is owned by the government because you guys had wrong wrongfully arrested Skid and Firefist. Release them right now. Now, when it comes to the Mutant Liberation Front, they have no idea that right now they're being followed by Cable, who is trying to stop them from blowing up this place, another government facility. Now, let's not forget that most of the new mutants are technically still stuck on Asgard because in our last story arc we had covered, our heroes were going up against Hela as a way to save Odin, which they were able to do. But here's the catch though. You see, around his time in Marvel Comics, Asgard was in the negative zone. And on top of that, the Rainbow Bridge was also destroyed. And so our heroes have no way back home until a fairy appears. Now, when it comes to this fairy, it has a map to give over to our heroes. And apparently, there is a way out of Asgard to get back over to Midgard, as long as our heroes follow that map. But now we have to jump over to Skid and Firefist. Now, in our last video, these two characters were severely injured by Freedom Force and also arrested by them as well. Now, remember... When it comes to Freedom Force, they used to be the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, but then they were given the chance to work for the government as a way to be forgiven for the crimes that they had committed. And so they go around to arrest other mutants out there. But then you have Skid and Firefist be confronted by Mystique, who is the leader of the Freedom Force. But she believes that our heroes are working for the Mutant Liberation Front, since that team keeps going around attacking different government facilities until the government releases Skid and Firefist. But you have Skid tell Mystique that she has no idea who they are, but she understands what they are doing. They know that Skid and Firefist were both wrongfully arrested. But you also have Skid saying that what Mystique and the others are doing is completely wrong, since they are mutants working for the government and hunting down other mutants. But now we jump over to Strife and get our first look at the character. Now, 
for the sake of this video, I am not going to explain his whole entire origin. Just for right now, all you know is that he is the leader to the Mutant Liberation Front. And that is really it. Now, when it comes to strife, he is very upset in the idea the government is not giving up both Skid and Fire Fist to him. They keep refusing his offer. Now, when it comes to Wildside, one of the members to his team, he says, hey boss, I don't know why you're so upset for, because technically, we're only using that as a smoke screen to hide our real objectives. And so the question is, what is their real objectives? But either way, you have Shry send his team in to finally go free both Skid and Fire Fist. So we see them going into the prison to break out both Skid and Fire Fist, except they have no idea that once again they are being followed by Cable. Cable is still upset at the idea that he failed to stop them the last time when it came to them blowing up that government facility in the beginning of this video. He also says that he has to protect both Skid and Fire Fist from the Mutant Liberation Front team. So after a few pages of him trying to stop them, well, he fails. Also, Skid and Fire Fist leave with them as well. Now, they only left with them because the guards of the prison was shooting at them and Fire Fist got shot, so they had to go somewhere safe. But since Cable was beaten by them, he was left behind at the prison and arrested by the guards there. But now we have to jump over to the next chapter where we pick up with Cable technically being interrogated because when it comes to Freedom Force, they actually believe that Cable is working with the Mutant Liberation Front even though we know and they know that he does not work with them or even for them. And matter of fact, we kind of find out that a lot of different characters may know about Cable, but they have no idea what he does. It seems like he does work for the government, but off the records. But either way, they still believe that he works for the Mutant Liberation Front. But they tell him, you are not going to leave until you are able to tell us why are you here for and why were you going after them for now you do have the team tell cable that hey listen we need to work together here because those guys they saw the right materials make more bombs to blow up more government facilities that means more innocent lives are going to be lost but Cable realized that he could not trust them at all. Now, when it comes to Freedom Force, they do get called away by Mystique because now they're going to have a meeting with X-Factor. Now, something I do want to mention is that X-Factor and the New Mutants, they have no idea that currently Skid and also Fire Fist were arrested, but at the same time have now joined the Mutant Liberation Front. But either way, you do have the two groups being happy to see one another because both groups went through a lot in a very short period of time. X-Factor traveled across the universe. The New Mutants were in Asgard, but either way, you have both groups coming together. But the question is for them, what happened to Skid and Fire Fist? Now we do jump over to Cable. Now when it comes to Cable, he begins the process of breaking out of prison because now Freedom Force is so busy getting ready for their meeting with X-Factor that you now only have regular guards watching him. And those guards are not up to the task to stop Cable. And so he is able to break out very easily. But getting back over to X-Factor, they watched the video where you have Freedom Force beating down on Fire Fist in our last video and then arresting him. And so for X-Factor, that's not okay at all because these kids are under their watch, under their protection. Freedom Force had no right to go after them at all. And so you have Cyclops saying, I want a meeting with them now and I better get that meeting. I want my kids out of that prison at this moment. But again, X-Factor has no idea that those two kids have actually left with a different team. Now, getting back over to Freedom Force, they got the message that was sent over to them by X-Factor. And they're kind of like, hey, listen, 
when we get there, we cannot tell them that we actually lost our kids because if we do, it's going to bring up more heat on us. But then the team gets word that Cable had escaped. And so you have Blob Pyro and a few other members of Freedom Force try to go out of their way to find Cable. But when it comes to Cable, he knew that sooner or later they would come after him. And so he was just waiting for the right time to attack them, to take them down, to give him a better chance of actually escaping. But we also get reminded that there is some drama right now going on when it comes to the new mutants. So for example, when it comes to Boom Boom, she has a crush on Richter, except Richter has a crush on, well, Wolfbane. And so for Boom Boom, she's very upset with the idea that she just changed clothes to look, you know, a tad bit more attractive towards Richter, and he does not even care at all. This man is all about Wolfbane, and these two characters are beginning the process of possibly coming together, and Boom Boom does not like that at all. Now, I want to jump back over to Cable, who's still trying to escape from the prison. And the only reason why, because you have the Blob trying his best to catch Cable, but Cable's just doing all these different kinds of things to make the job harder for Blob. And Blob is just getting more and more upset with the idea of not being able to grab just one guy. But now we have to jump over to Wolfbane and also Richter. Now you have Wolfbane calling up Mormon Taggart because when it came to Wolfbane, when she first appeared in Marvel Comics, she was technically a orphan. And you have Mormon Taggart take her in and became her adoptive mother. And so Wolfbane, she looks at Mora as her mother. But here's the problem. You see, let's not forget, in our last few X-Men videos, we have been seeing a lot of different characters saying that Mormon Tagger has been acting weird, acting differently, more aggressive than usual. And matter of fact, when it comes to Wolfbane, when she calls up Mormon Tagger, she's all like, hey, you know, so I haven't called, I've been gone for a while, I was on Asgard, but I'm back now, and it's nice to talk to you. But you have met Tagger say, I don't care where you were, you know what? I don't like the idea that my child, my adoptive daughter, was out there doing all these different kind of things. You know what? I am tired of you being out there and putting your life in danger. I feel like it's time for you to finally come back home to me. It's time for you to come back to Mirror Island. And you have Wolfbane say no. But Mora says, I don't care what you say because technically you are my child and you need to come back home. Now the last page of this chapter, it really shows Cable being able to get to a helicopter to get away from the prison, but also Freedom Force. Now Mystique is not happy at all because when it comes to Cable, he knows too much. If anything gets out, their entire operation is going to get shut down. And so you have Mystique tell her team, you better go after him and bring him back here now. Do you understand me? And so, they gotta go get them. And so as we dive into the opening pages of the final chapter, we do pick up with Cable trying his best to get away from Freedom Force, but they're on his tail. And matter of fact, his chopper is damaged as well, so it begins to go down. But before he does crash, he says, you know what? I'm gonna make sure you guys also come down with me. And he's able to hit their helicopter as well to make them crash with him. Now, when it comes to the new mutants, they're still dealing with the idea that you're going to have Wolfbane most likely leaving the team because of Mormon Tagger. And they're trying their best to figure out how can they make her happy? How can they help her out here? Because she is very depressed of the idea that she may no longer see her friends, maybe never again, actually. But as we go back over to Cable, we do see that Cable was able to survive the plane crash or the helicopter crash. But as soon as he gets out of the water, he is instantly being followed by Freedom Force. Now, this is going to lead into him meeting Gut with the New Mutants very soon. But first, we have to jump back over to the New Mutants. 
And we see the New Mutants right now going out of their way to get a go-away present for Wolfbane because she's leaving the team. But like I said earlier for Cable, it's going to lead into them meeting Cable and then having Cable begin the process of taking over the team. Now, we jump back over to Cable, who's now getting beaten down by Freedom Force, but luckily for Cable, the new mutants were nearby, and so they are able to jump in the battle to help him out. But here is the thing though, y'all. You see, when it comes to Cable, while he's fighting against Freedom Force with the help of the new mutants, he's kind of playing this teacher role already, kind of like Charles Xavier or like Magneto, telling them how to take down the different members of Freedom Force. But after a few pages, you do have our heroes being able to actually defeat Freedom Force. And so you have our heroes say, hey, Cable, come back with us to our ship so that you are able to relax, but also have some protection from them. But getting back over to the base of X-Factor, we see more Metagger had arrived, and it's time for her and Wolfbane to leave. Now, let's not forget that Richter, he has feelings for uh, Wolfbane, and he hates the idea of her leaving. And so you have Richter going out of his way to destroy the helicopter that more Metagger came in to buy them more time to figure out how to keep Wolfbane here. Now, when it comes to more Metagger, she does call in another helicopter, but it's gonna take a while. So you have Richter say, you know what? It's time for me to think of a new idea to hopefully keep Wolfbane here with me and the others. And his plan actually works out. And here is the reason why. Because you didn't have Cable and the rest of the new mutants come back to the base. And once they come back, you have Cable say, listen, Mormon Tagger, I'm going to take all these kids with me for a special kind of mission. Now, when it comes to Mormon Tagger, she knows the mission going on could be a suicide mission. But at the same time, she feels like that Wolfbane and the rest of the new mutants will be better off with Cable rather than X-Factor or possibly the X-Men. And so you have more Metagra say, yeah, you know what? Go ahead and take her. And this is why I say we are going to see the beginning of the end of the new mutant line and the beginning of X-Force. But What's going on here, YouTube, and welcome back to another comic book video. Okay, so we're going to continue our coverage over X-Men comics as we work our way up to Days of Future Present, the next crossover that we are going to talk about. But first, we got to jump back over to New Mutants, and the reason why, because we got to cover a two-part story arc where we do see Cable begin the process of becoming the new mentor for the New Mutants, their new teacher, but also their new leader, as they take on new kinds of missions they never taken before. But also, we see the death of Sabretooth, or the supposed death of Sabretooth. And you see what I mean as we go through today's video. And so the opening pages of this book does remind us of the Mutant Massacre. Now remember, the Mutant Massacre was the first big X-Men crossover where you had the Marauders, a new team at that time, go into the tunnels of the Morlocks and kill off most of the Morlocks. Not all of them, just most of them. Now some of the survivors did stay with Mormon Taggart on Mir Island, but some of the others had returned back to the tunnels of the Morlocks. Now, the opening pages of this book, we do pick up with Sabretooth, who was a member of the Marauders, still is, but when it comes to Sabretooth, he feels like he has to go back down in the tunnels to make sure that he actually finished off the job by killing off the Morlocks who had returned to the tunnels. Now, we do see one Morlock who's technically blind, but he's able to see in the dark but he also knows that Sabretooth is nearby. 
But unfortunately, this Morlock is not ready to go up against Sabretooth and easily killed off by him. Now, there is somebody else in the sewers as well, and that would be Caliban. Now, the last time we saw Caliban, he had joined forces with Apocalypse. He became one of Apocalypse, not horsemen, but one of his people. And so currently we see Caliban is now in the sewers, but he looks completely different. Like Apocalypse had changed him like he did with Archangel. But now we are able to jump over to the New Mutants. Now, with Cable officially taking over the team, he felt like they need their own base. And the last time when it came to the New Mutants, they were staying with X-Factor on their ship. And so now you have Cable and the rest of his now team heading over to the school of Charles Xavier. Now remember, the school was blown up thanks to Mr. Sinister, but not the basement level, where the danger room is at, and other kind of rooms are at as well. And so when it comes to our heroes, they're gonna use this place as their base. Now, for most of the new mutants, they're new to the school. They never saw the school. They never even heard about the danger room. And so when it comes to Cable, he said, listen, if we are going to be a team, we got to start training now. So at three o'clock, let's meet back here and we are going to train in the danger room. Now we have to jump back over to Caliban and here is the reason why. So Caliban is trying his best to find Sabretooth and the reason why because he remembers that Sabretooth was one of the Marauders but Sabretooth had killed off most of the Morlocks because that man was bloodthirsty back then. And so for Caliban, Sabretooth has to pay. Now, when it comes to Sabretooth, he knows that Caliban is following him. But either way, he's down for the idea of killing off Caliban. But now we have to jump back over to the New Mutants as we see them inside the Danger Room, going through their first training with Cable in charge. Now, while going through training, I want to focus on Richter, and here is the reason why. So, in our last video, when the rest of the New Mutants have brought Cable back home, Richter recognized Cable automatically. But here's the thing. He does not like Cable at all. In our last video, we had no idea why. But in this video, we do learn a tad bit of why he hates Cable. Because in the middle of the training session, the danger room is too much for Richter. And the whole entire session has to be stopped. And he walks away angry at himself, but also angry at Cable. And the reason why? Because Cable was involved in some kind of way when it comes to Richter's father. And we have no idea what exactly happened between Richter's father and Cable. But Cable does not remember Richter at all. But now Richter is going to give us our first major problem of this story. You see, when it comes to Richter, he had disappeared because while you have our heroes trying on their new outfits that they're going to wear when they're out in the field with Cable, you didn't have Wolfbane run into the room freaking out because she can't find Richter. And she believes that Richter has gone into the tunnels of the Morlocks. Now, here is the reason why it's such a problem. Yes, you do have Caliban fighting fighting against Sabretooth, but when it comes to our heroes, they were warned by Jean Grey to not go into the tunnels of the Morlocks because in our last X-Men video involving Jean Grey, Forge, and Banshee, they had a run-in with Mask, the new leader of the Morlocks, and Mask is doing some crazy dark things at this time in Marvel Comics in the tunnels of the Morlocks. And so Jean told them, hey, to stay safe, do not go into the tunnels at all. But now Richter has gone into the tunnels. Now, the reason why Richter had went into the tunnels of the Morlocks is to prove a point. You see, for Richter, he's saying the team was doing just fine before Cable had arrived. But also, the new mutants are beginning to change completely different, but for the worse. Because he's saying the new mutants are beginning to take orders like it's no big deal. And before Cable had arrived, this was a team full of teenagers who would not usually follow orders at all. Magneto, X-Factor, you name it. If they were some adult that gave them orders, the new mutants would disobey. But now Cable, 
comes around and he says, hey, do this, do that. They're all like, yeah, boss, we got you. And so for Richter, he says, that's not okay at all. And so he went into the tunnels of the Morlocks to take out Mask to prove that, hey, guys, listen, if I was able to take out Mask on my own, that means we don't need Cable. And then things can go back to the old ways. Now, while he is thinking that, he's then attacked, not attacked, he's confronted by Caliban. Now, these two characters, they met before, but Caliban has been changed thanks to Apocalypse. And so he does not remember uh, Richter at all. But while you have the two characters talking to one another, Sabretooth arrives. Now, as soon as he arrives, he is able to severely injure Richter. And it seems like Richter might be killed off by Sabretooth. But then Caliban steps in. And now these two guys are going to fight against one another. And then, when it comes to Cable and the rest of his team, they're getting ready to go into the tunnels of the Morlocks to hopefully save Richter in time because that man needs their help before Sabretooth or possibly Caliban kills him off. And so as we dive into the next chapter, we continue the idea of seeing Sabretooth fighting against Caliban. And really, it's Caliban showing Sabretooth that he is a completely different person than the last time they saw each other. That Caliban does have the ability to possibly take down Sabretooth. Now, for Sabretooth, he believes still that he may have a chance to take down Caliban and put his hands on Richter. But at the same time, though, it's Caliban saying, you can try, but I'm going to kill you here and now. And for Richter, he's scared because he still believes that Sabretooth or Caliban might kill him after one of them win their battle. Now, when it comes to the new mutant, they do arrive in the tunnels of the Morlocks to hopefully save Richter. Now, while you have the new mutants traveling in the tunnels, they are confronted by, well, the Morlocks, and they're being led by Mask. And like I said earlier, the Morlocks are technically not good at the moment because of Mask. And anytime somebody comes into his territory, he does use his ability to change their body appearance. And so when Mask arrives with a group of Morlocks, they surround the new mutants. And it's kind of like, hey, you're in my tunnels. Why are you here for right now? And you have Cable tell him, listen, we only came down here to save one of our own. And that's really it. So please get out of our way. Now, if you don't, we can fight, but most likely you are going to lose. Now for Mask, he kind of realized that Cable's kind of serious right now. Like Cable's saying, hey, you want to fight? We can fight, but you're going to lose. And so you have Mask walk away. But you do have Mask say, I'm hoping that you other mutants out there will go ahead and kill each other off. Less of a mess for me to clean up down the road. Now, for our heroes, the new mutants, they do arrive to join in the battle between Sabretooth and Caliban. Now, at first, you do have most of the new mutants shift their focus onto Sabretooth first. Now, when they do, Sabretooth is able to take the ones out who try to attack him. Now, Caliban does get some attention as well, but that comes later. And matter of fact, once you have our heroes shift their focus over to Caliban and being able to take him down just for a moment here, they realize that Sabretooth has disappeared, but he also has taken Richter. And this is going to lead into something very important. And here's the reason why. So once you have Sabretooth being able to grab uh, Richter, you didn't have Richter being able to push his powers to a new limit as a way to help him to escape here. Now, when it comes to Richter, at this time in Marvel Comics, he only had the ability of seismic energy, being able to cause huge vibrations in different kinds of objects. And here is the reason why I'm saying that right now, because later on in comics, especially in Excalibur Volume 4, in the whole Krakoa era, his powers got upgraded. But at this time, that's all he could do is cause huge vibration in different kinds of objects. And so when it comes to Sabretooth, when he does try to attack Richter, you have Richter being able to use his powers to a new extent and being able to draw a huge piece of the tunnels right on top of Sabretooth. Now, once you have the new mutants being able to 
catch up to uh, Richter, they do see that he is okay, but unfortunately so is Saratooth as well. Now, when it comes to our heroes, they're not scared of him anymore. They're kind of like, hey, we're all here together now, and so we should be able to actually take you down very easily. But then the Morlocks arrive. Now, for the Morlocks, they say, hey, He's in our tunnels, and matter of fact, we want revenge against him for what he had done to us back in the Mutant Massacre. But then you have Caliban also arrive. He says, no, none of y'all are going to fight against Ibertooth. I am going to fight against him because right now, I need to give him payback for what he has done to my people, the Morlocks. And so literally, you have everyone just step to the side to allow Caliban to fight against Sabretooth. Now, when it comes to their battle, it does not last that long because you literally have Caliban being able to snap the back and the neck of Sabretooth just like that, instantly. And so we're left to believe in the possibility that Sabretooth is officially dead. Now, after that battle, you do have our heroes return back to their base. And once they do, you have Richter right now in the medical room getting some medical assistance. But you did have the rest of his team tell him, like, this is your fault. Like, it's your fault that you got severely injured. It's your fault that we almost got killed down there in the Morlock tunnels. Like, what is your deal? Why do you hate Cable so much? Now, for Richter... He does not tell us why he hates Cable so much, but he does understand that he most likely should give Cable another chance to see if Cable is different than the last time he saw Cable and possibly work with him and the rest of his team make sure that they survive future missions. And so... What's going on there, YouTube, and welcome back to another comic book video. Okay, so we're going to, well, we're going to sit down and cover Days of Future Present, the next crossover that I have been talking about doing on my channel for a while. And guys, we are here. Now, this was a four-part story arc that took place in four different annuals. Fantastic Four Annual Number 23 X-Factor Annual number 5, New Mutants Annual number 6, and X-Men Annual number 14. All four annuals tell a story about one character coming from a supposed future and causing a lot of problems for our heroes. And that would be Franklin Richards. Yes, you heard that right. We are going to see Franklin Richards go up against X-Factor, the New Mutants. X-Men and the Fantastic Four, but at the same time, we are also introducing a new character from the supposed future that Franklin Richards come. Now, this is actually a sequel to Days of Future Past, which of course showed us a dark future where the mutants had lost, the superheroes had lost. Matter of fact, all of North America is being controlled by the Sentinels, and most of the X-Men are dead, most of the heroes are dead, and if you are a mutant, you are possibly dead or put inside a camp. But this storyline right here is a sequel to that story, and you'll see what I mean as we go through today's video. But the opening chapter for this crossover takes place in Fantastic Four Annual Number 23. Now, the opening pages of this book, we pick up with the Fantastic Four heading back home to their base, except something is wrong. You see, around this time in Marvel Comics, the Fantastic Four was staying in a building called Four Freedom Plaza because the Baxter building was actually shot up into space by Doctor Doom a few years back. And so, Four Freedom Plaza was their current base. But when our heroes come back home, their new home is no longer there. The Baxter building has returned. But get this, the public, the people who are just riding their bikes, walking around, or in their cars, they're acting completely normal. They're acting like the Baxter building had never left at all. And so you have our heroes wondering, what in the world is going on? Where is their old home? And so you have Reed and the rest of the team go inside to see what in the world is going on here. 
And so once you have our heroes go inside the actual building, they see all these people who used to work in the Baxter building. But here's the problem though. These people, they seem like they haven't aged since the Baxter building was shot up in space, which means that these people most likely are not actually real. Matter of fact, you have reset one of the guys had retired a while back. When I see him now, he looks the same as he did before he had retired years ago. Now you have our hero decide to go inside the elevator to go up to their part of the building. Except when they do, all the different tracks they used to have in the Baxter building are now here again in this new version of it and currently attacking our heroes. Now you do have our heroes use their abilities to get rid of all those different traps and you have re been able to shut down the rest that could most likely activate. But once they're able to reach the main part of their home in the Baxter building, well, everything looks the same as it did before it was shot into space. And so you have our heroes wondering, what in the world is going on here? How is this even possible? How in the world did the Baxter building come back technically to life? Except while you have our heroes just walking around this place, they're then confronted by well themselves the fantastic four now i should also mention that around this time in marvel comics the fantastic four really was the fantastic five you had reed richards you had the human torch you had susan but you also had the thing and she thing as well or really she was calling herself miss marvel again you see she thing is sharon ventura she was a miss marvel character but then she went through some cosmic rays which then changed her over to a she thing now she used the code name miss marvel again around this point in marvel comics now when it comes to ben grimm he was just just a regular looking dude but then you have our heroes being confronted by past versions of themselves and of course it does lead into a battle except our heroes the original fantastic four they actually lose to their past selves but now you have reese say you know what this is the perfect time to figure out what in the world is going on here now, when it comes to the past read, he begins to run some different tests on our Fantastic Four to kind of figure out what exactly is going on here. Now, with those tests, he was able to come find out that, well, both groups are literally the same people, the same Reed, the same John, the same Ben Grimm, the same Susan Storm. And so you have the past Reed say, okay, you know what? These guys must have come from the future are most likely an alternate timeline. But you have our say R, get this, you guys came from the past into our time. Now you didn't have both groups begin to compare notes with one another to see how they are different from one another. And then it all comes down to Franklin. And you have our say, look, you don't even have a Franklin Richards, but the past Fantastic Four, they said, no, we do have a Franklin Richards and he walks into the room. But here's the thing though, he's a grown man. Now, when it comes to the Fantastic Four, they believe that this Franklin Richards powers work very similar to their Franklin Richard powers. And so they tell him, listen, we believe that you had changed reality in our time. But the question is why? And where did you come from? Now, this adult Franklin, he begins to freak out. And the reason why? Because he feels like our Fantastic Four are in the wrong, that they should not be here. That that the ones he had created around him are the real versions of the Fantastic Four, his parents. But then after freaking out, he just disappears. He flies away. But once he leaves, the Baxter building turns back into for Freedom Plaza, the base the team was currently using. But you have our heroes wondering what they should do next when it comes to this adult version of Franklin Richards. But now we have to jump over to the base of Excalibur. Now, Excalibur was one of the many X-Men teams around this time in Marvel Comics. But when it comes to Rachel Summers, she's talking to her team member, Megan. Now, when it comes to Rachel Summers, she is going to be 
really important for this storyline because she came from the Days of Future Past timeline. But when she had arrived back in this timeline, well, her mind does not remember anything about her future at all. Just small pieces here and there, and that's it. And so when it comes to Megan, when she asks Rachel, hey, what was your future like? Rachel honestly cannot answer that question for her. Now, when it comes to Rachel, she senses something, and she realizes there's something big nearby. And so she leaves to head over to that location. But now we jump over to, well, Forge and also Banshee. Around his time in Marvel Comics, the X-Men were technically disbanded, but for a good reason. But you have Forge and Banshee on their way to try to find the different members of the X-Men. But then out of nowhere, they are confronted by the adult Franklin Richards, who apparently remembers them but only from his timeline. And so he realized that this Forge and this Banshee, they're too young to be his Forge and Banshee. And so he freaks out and leaves just like that. But while you have Franklin Richards just bouncing all over the place, apparently something or someone else had picked up on his energy. And now their goal is to recover him, to find him and most likely bring him down. Now, we jump back over to the Fantastic Four. And now, you have our heroes wondering what to do next. Like, what should they do when it comes to Franklin Richards? But the first step is to find him. And then after that, you can try to figure out what to do next. And so you have our heroes try to leave. Except when they try to leave, they are confronted by an army of robots. Now, these robots are very similar to Sentinels. And here is the reason why. They were sent there to find Franklin Richards. But the adult one, who is no longer there. But then they detect the other Franklin Richards, R. Franklin, who is a child but who also is a mutant. Around his time in Marvel Comics, Franklin was a mutant. I do know in the present day comics, it all changed. He's no longer a mutant, but back at this time, he was. And so these smaller robots, they go on attack mode for young Franklin because he is a mutant, very similar to a sentinel. Now, you also had these robots go after Reed and also Susan as well because they are his parents. They're at blame for creating a child that is a mutant. But you do have our heroes being able to use their powers to get rid of all those robots. But then after the battle, you have Banshee and Forge appear. Now when they appear, they tell the Fantastic Four, hey, um, just a moment ago, we had a run in with a Franklin Richards, but he was a grown man. What in the world is going on over here? Now, they see young Franklin. They're like, okay, well, we see your Franklin. He's a boy, but when we saw earlier was a grown man. And so you have the Fantastic Four help Banshee and Forge understand what is exactly happening here. But now their goal is to find Franklin. And so they ask young Franklin, hey, where would you go if you want to hide somewhere? And he says, oh, that easy. The Powers the home of the Power Pack team. Now, Power Pack was just a group of kids who gained their abilities from an alien. And they were just your regular kids, superhero team, go on some crazy wild adventures. But there was a point in time where Franklin was part of that team. He would come and go. And so it made sense that he would be there hiding out with the rest of Power Pack. When it comes to Power Pack, they have no idea that they have been playing with an adult Franklin Richards. What he has done was he used his abilities to alter their minds, to make them believe that they were playing with a younger Franklin Richards, not an adult one. As a matter of fact, when it comes to Power Pack's father, he believed that his children we're playing with the young Franklin. And so when Fantastic Four arrived, they come back to their senses and realize that they have been playing with an adult version of their friend. Now you do have our heroes being able to take the adult Franklin and head back home to their base. 
except on the way home, you didn't have Franklin freak out once again because he sees a building that to him should not be there at all. And so he disappears once again. And so then you have Forge and Reed being able to create devices that should be able to locate Franklin Richards and to hopefully bring him back over here. And so you have our heroes split up into two groups. One group goes north, one group goes south, and hopefully they can find Franklin very soon. But now we jump over to New Mutants Annual number 6. Now, when it comes to Franklin Richards, we now know where he went to. He went over to the school of Charles Xavier. Now, let's not forget, by this point in Marvel Comics, school is long gone. It was blown up by Mr. Sinister. And so for Franklin, he's kind of like, this is not right. There was a school here. What happened here? What in the world is going on? And so you have Franklin going out of his way to use his abilities to bring the school back to life. Just bam, just like that. Except when he does it, he brings it back to the point where he remembers from his future. And so it honestly does not look like a school, but more like a barrack. But now we have to jump over to the bad guy of the book, and that is going to be Ahab. Now, when it comes to Ahab, he's also from the Days of Future Past timeline. Matter of fact, he was the leader of the Hounds. Now, when it comes to Hounds, they were basically used in the future as a way to hunt down mutants. They were mutants who were acting like wild animals who were sent out to hunt down other mutants. But when it comes to hounds, their leader was a hab. But apparently he's here right now in the past trying to find Franklin Richards. And here is the reason why. Because back in the original story for Days of Future Past, Franklin died. And so the question is, if he had died in the future, how in the world is he here right now in the past. Either way, he does send out one of his hounds and a few more robots to hopefully find Franklin. Now, by this point in the Marvel timeline, the New Mutants were still a team, but the New Mutants were now being led by Cable. Now, by this point, we don't know much about Cable, but he is on a mission to stop someone else, better known as Strife. But currently, we see our heroes in the Danger Room. You see, even though the school was blown up, the sub-basement of the school was kept intact. And so you have the New Mutants use the sub-basement of the school as their new base. And so when we jump over to the New Mutants, we just see them currently just in the Danger Room doing their thing and having a good old training session. And so once you have the new mutants being able to wrap up their training session, well, that is when they are confronted by another group of characters. Now, this new group, they're also called the new mutants, but they're from the Days of Future Past timeline. Franklin Richards once again had changed reality around him to be able to bring his friends into this reality. Now, they're not real, but for him, they are real. And to our heroes, it seems, again, they are actually real. Now, our heroes are wondering what in the world is going on. Now, in this new group, Cypher is part of that group. And remember, in our coverage over the New Mutants, Cypher died in the main Marvel Universe back in Fall of the Mutants, but apparently in Days of Future Past timeline, he's alive. Now, in our timeline, he was bonded with Warlock, but in th that timeline, he is not. He is actually bonded to Warlock's father, Magnus, which sometimes can make him a bit crazy. But for our heroes, they're kind of wondering, why in the world is this other group right now in their base, in their danger room? But you have the other group say, no, you're in our danger room, you're in our home. And so you have the two sides begin to fight one another. Now their battle does go on for a few pages, but it does lead back upstairs. And once they get upstairs, they realize that Franklin Richards had brought the school technically back to life, but how it was in his timeline. But also, he brought Banshee from his timeline into this reality as well. Now, this Banshee is very confused when he sees our new mutants 
but especially Cable. And he says, hmm, Cable, what are you doing here? Now, our Cable, he has no idea what this Banshee is talking about, but you didn't have our heroes realize that it has to be Franklin Richards. He's well known across the Marvel Universe and they know that sometimes his powers can go awry and sometimes when it comes to Franklin he will warp reality around people and themselves or bring things to life like he is at this moment. And so you have our hero say this is not your timeline. Like you are trying to change our timeline into your timeline so that it'll seem familiar. But this is not your time at all. And matter of fact, when it comes to Banshee that he brought to life, you have that Banshee say, they're right. You cannot do this. You have to let us go. You have to move on. It's kind of like his own mind telling him what you're doing right now is not correct. But at the same time, he cannot accept the idea that his time is gone and he's somewhere else in the timeline. And so he begins to cry after letting everything go back to normal. Now, after you have Franklin Richards disappear once again, you didn't have Reed Richards, Susan, and also Banshee arrive at the school because they're one of the two groups in the last chapter who are trying to find Franklin Richard. And so when they arrive at the school, they realize that they're too late, but then they are able to catch the new mutants up to explain what is exactly going on here when it comes to this adult Franklin Richards. But while you have our heroes talking to one another, that is the moment they get attacked by another group of robots being led by another hound. And so this hound and the robots begin to attack our heroes. Now this battle does not last that long. Matter of fact, you do have our heroes being able to take down all the robots very easily. But when it comes to the hound, he is able to get his hands on the young Franklin Richards. But luckily, you have Richter use his ability to shoot the hound out of the sky. And it was a huge crash to the ground for the hound to the point where he's on the verge of dying. But before he does die, he talks to Richter. Now, when it comes to this hound, he actually does talk to Richter and says, listen, the reason why I was sent here is because of my master Ahab. We are trying to go after Franklin Richards because that man has the ability to change history. And if he does, it could change our future as well. And so we came back here to protect our future. Really, I came here because I'm being forced to come here by my master. You see, I'm a hound and hounds are trained by a have to be savages to be used to chase after our own kind. Now, after you have Rick to learn all those different things about hounds and why they're here for and who they're master, you have a hab appear to go ahead and silence his hound to make sure that he's not able to share any more kind of information. Now, when it comes to Franklin, we see that he went over to a museum and apparently in his timeline, this was a fun place for him. But once again, he does change reality around him, where this time he creates a version of Rachel Summers. Because remember, in his timeline, those two characters, they were in love with one another. And so now he had created a younger version of her, being able to spend some time with her. Now, why you have these two supposed characters talking to one another, a sentinel appears. Now, when the Sentinels try to attack Franklin, none of their attacks are actually working. You see, all the attacks are just going through him. But on top of that, when it comes to Franklin, he does not notice that he's being attacked because all those attacks are not being able to hit him. And so while you had the Sentinels and also the Hounds trying their best to attack Franklin, you didn't have Reed, Sue, and the new mutants arrive. Now, when they arrive, they tried their best to help out Franklin. And so a battle does happen for a few pages. But then at the tail end of the battle, you didn't have one of the Hounds fly completely through Franklin, like he was some kind of hologram. But once that Hound had flown through him, 
that is the moment he takes notice that there is a battle happening around him involving the new mutants reed and sue and so you then have franklin use his abilities to get rid of all the sentinels to get rid of all the hounds now when i say get rid of them i don't mean like okay he sent them away and it's all good and done no he had destroyed the robots completely he had killed off those hounds now when he kills off the hounds the young franklin is now scared of himself he's afraid of the idea of becoming this adult version who has gone crazy now when it comes to adult franklin he says listen to make sure that my time does not happen i have to get rid of my younger self's powers if i do that that means that my future will not happen at all and so you have the adult version of franklin richards be able to take away the powers of the young franklin richards to make sure the days of future past does not happen at all but now we jump over to x factor annual number five for the third chapter of days of future present where we pick up with franklin richards once again and you have him walking over to the ship that belongs to x factor and he says that place right there isn't right but now we have to jump over to X Factor. Now, when it comes to X Factor, they are the original X-Men who were brought back together as a new team once Jean Grey was found at the bottom of the bay by the Fantastic Four, where we had learned that she was never the Phoenix in the first place. But when it comes to X Factor, they're currently having a training session slash fun game as well. But here's the problem though. You have Cyclops getting very upset with how Jean Grey is playing playing the game because he believes that she's going a tad bit too far with the game to the point where he's afraid that somebody might get hurt and it actually does lead into a small argument between the two of them but why have the two arguing well out of nowhere their base better known as the ship automatically disappears completely now, of course, this leads into our heroes free falling. So you do have our heroes try their best to save each other, but to also save the son of Cyclops, better known as Christopher Summers or Christopher Nathaniel Summers. Either way, you do have our heroes being able to save themselves. And now they're wondering what exactly happened to their ship. Now, they have no idea that it was actually Franklin Richards because Franklin realized that ship does not belong in the skyline of New York because in his time, there was no ship. And so he went out of his way to get rid of it. But now we have to jump over to a rab. Now, when it comes to a rab, he's currently wondering how in the world Franklin Richards is here. Now, for him, he remembered that Franklin had no powers, but on top of that, Franklin had died by his hands. And so he is very confused how one, Franklin's alive again, and two, how Franklin also has powers as well. But either way, you didn't have a rab say, you know what? I'll just send more hounds after him. But then one of the hounds does not want to chase after Franklin. And the reason why? Because Franklin brings hope. Any idea that their future could possibly be changed. And so you had a hound tell a rap, no, I will not help you hunt down that man at all. But now we jump over to the Human Torch, Ben Grimm, she think, or Miss Marvel, and also Forge, the other group that went south when it came to trying to find Franklin Richards. Now, they were able to pick up on his powers when he used it to remove the ship of the X-Factor team. And so when our heroes arrive at that location, all they see is, well, X-Factor. And you have our heroes tell the Fantastic Four and Forge like, hey, our ship had just magically disappeared and we have no idea how. And so you have our other heroes tell X Factor, this is the reason why, Franklin Richards. And so you have Cyclops and X Factor agree to help out the Fantastic Four and Forge to figure out what in the world is going on when it comes to Franklin Richards. 
And so after their agreement to work together, you then have our heroes head over to what could be the next location of where Franklin is at. Except when they do arrive at that location, well, out of nowhere, they have a bolt of fire just fly by them. And of course, that is the Phoenix. And we saw back in the first chapter that she had detected the powers of Franklin Richards. But here's the problem, though. You see, first, she has no idea who he he is because like I said earlier she does not remember anything about her timeline at this moment but two she also knows that Franklin is beginning to take away her powers of the Phoenix that somehow he's able to absorb her abilities now you do have the rest of the heroes arrive when we saw earlier in this chapter but the one character I want to focus on is Jean Grey and here is the reason why this is her first time meeting Rachel Summers now before we are able to talk more about this actual meeting I want to bring up two more things the first is that Arab has sent over more robots to actually attack our heroes to go after Franklin Richards but in the middle of that you have Franklin freaking out because when he sees Rachel Summers as the Phoenix he remembers that she was not the Phoenix back in their timeline. And so for him, it's kind of like, what is wrong with you? How are you able to do that? You should not be able to do that at all. And so seeing the woman he loves being different, it bothers him. And he wants to take things back to normal. Take her back the way she was before she had left their timeline. Before she became the Phoenix. And so because of that trauma, of seeing her different but also things in prior chapter once again he releases a huge amount of energy getting rid of all those robots but also depowering the phoenix for the time being sending rachel down to the ground now when it comes to jean gray she wants to make sure that rachel is okay except when she goes down there you have rachel say oh well i guess it's time for you to know that i'm your daughter from an alternate timeline and Jean Grey and Cyclops had no idea that Rachel was their daughter now Cyclops he knew about Rachel for a while but Jean Grey this is her first meeting and she goes to find out that this is her daughter from an alternate timeline now you do have some of the other characters go out of their way to find Franklin and when they do well that is the moment they get attacked by some more sentinels now they're really after Franklin but like we saw earlier when it comes to Franklin he has no idea that they are there and really when they try to attack him well he's basically unharmed by their attacks and so once you have our heroes being able to deal with them and they disappear that's when you have Franklin get up and he just leaves once again. But now we have to get back over to the meeting between Jean Grey and Rachel Summers. And this meeting is really important because like I said earlier, this is their first time meeting each other, but also this is Jean Grey finding out that Rachel is her daughter from some alternate timeline. Now you have Cyclops come back as well. And so at this moment, he finds out that Rachel is his daughter. Now he knew about Rachel, like she's been around for a while. She was part of the X-Men, but he had no idea that she was his daughter. Now she does tell Jean Grey and Cyclops that her time Line, there was no Nathan there was no Christopher at all she was the only child their only child now for Jean Grey she cannot accept the idea that Rachel Summers is her daughter now there is a reason and I really can't say it's good or bad but once we do sit down and talk about it you'll kind of decide for yourself now in the middle of their conversation they're then attacked once again by a hab now he brought a whole army with him to go after our heroes but first he goes after rachel summers because like i said in the past on the past her timeline she was actually a hound and so 
he had control over her for a good period of time. Now she was able to break free, but as soon as he appears, he is able to recapture her mind, to make her a hound once again. Now she's able to break free by using the powers of the Phoenix. And when she does, she's kind of like, okay, you know what? Mm -mm. I cannot sit here or stand here and have you guys judge me on how I was acting just a moment ago because you don't understand what I was in my own timeline, that I was a hound. But also she can tell that Jean Grey is not going to accept her. And so you have Rachel just leave. Now after she leaves, Ahab is all like, listen, she's gone. But right now, I have to get rid of you guys because right now, you're also helping to protect Franklin, my other target. And so you have a have sent out an army to attack our heroes. And so while you have our heroes battling against a hab, you didn't have Cyclops realize that there's something going on in the middle of the sky. Every single time his optic blast would shoot up in the air, it would stop midpoint in the air. And he has no idea why. And so you didn't have our heroes realize that it has to be something going on with a hab. And so he pulls Reed over. And you have Reed and Cyclops both realize that when it comes to a hab, his base that he has been working out of is currently hiding in some kind of pocket dimension sitting outside of time and space. And so you have our heroes believe that if they are able to get rid of that base, then most likely he'll have to go back to his time. Now, luckily for our heroes, the rest of their team arrive. The New Mutants, the rest of the Fantastic Four, and also you have uh, Banshee as well. And so while you have both parties being able to work together to fight against a Hab, you have the Human Torch and Iceman being able to do enough damage to destroy the ship that belongs to a hab and once the ship is gone all his creatures including him disappear just like that and so at first we're left to believe that most likely they were sent back to their time but then you have our heroes having the chance to finally take a breather you think that cyclops and rachel are going to have the ability to actually talk about rachel summers except that is the moment you have franklin reappear now when he does he says listen this timeline is not right in my time you guys never had a son you only had a daughter that's the person who should be here right now the woman i love and so you have franklin Franklin once again trying to change his world into his own world by getting rid of Christopher. He disappears in the arms of Cyclops and then Franklin disappears and we're left to wonder what exactly happened to Nathan or Christopher for some of y'all out there. But now we jump into the final chapter for today's video, where we actually pick up with Rachel Summers. Now we see Rachel just enjoying a meal, a good old burger at a diner, and she remembers that in her timeline, she couldn't do this at all. But while trying to enjoy this nice burger, you didn't have three guys try to rob the place. Now you do have Rachel being able to use her abilities to stop the guys, but while doing that, she sees somebody watching Watching her and she remembers who it is it's Franklin Richards now when she goes outside he's no longer there and so she's wondering where in the world he went to and so you have Rachel Summers release a mental cry now this mental cry is heard across the world and we do see different characters of the Marvel Universe hearing this mental cry but after doing it she's then confronted by Franklin Richards and now she remembers who he is but here's the problem like I said earlier Franklin Richards died in the original timeline for days of future past and so for her she's kind of wondering why in the world is he here if he is here could this be a trap can she actually trust him and he says scan my mind which she does and when she does scan his mind she becomes to find out that it is franklin and you have the two share a kiss because again these two used to date back in the original timeline for these characters 
But after you had Rachel and Franklin be able to share that kiss, they head over to the base of the Fantastic Four to inform the X-Men, X-Factor, and Fantastic Four that these two characters are going to try to build a new life together somewhere. But here's the problem though, guys. You see, when it comes to Reed and Sue, they have some concerns. Like one, where is Nathan Summers? Two, where is the X-Factor ship? And three, what about their Franklin? Because the young Franklin is currently in a coma and he was in that coma ever since the adult Franklin had took away his abilities. But then you have the adult Franklin use his abilities to change the mindset of Reed and Sue, where they are no longer worried about anything they just mentioned earlier. Instead of kind of like, you know what? This is a celebration. It's really great that you and Rachel will be able to spend some time together. And then you have Franklin and Rachel leave. Now, as soon as they leave, Reed and Sue, their minds go back to normal, which tells them that Franklin was using his abilities. And so you have all the heroes realize that they have to come together one more time and try to figure out what to do with Franklin to get everything back to normal. But now we pick up with Storm and Gambit. Now, around this time in Marvel Comics, Storm was a child. And let me explain why. So in an earlier story arc that we had covered, you had the X-Men fight against the Nanny and also Orphan Maker. Now, at the end of that battle, we were left to believe that Storm had died. But of course, she did not. Instead, she was kidnapped by the Nanny because the Nanny wanted to has Storm under her control, kind of like a child under her control. But she realized Storm's willpower is just too strong because she was a grown woman. And so you have the nanny use a device to de-age Storm down back into a young girl so that she could use her powers on Storm to control her. But Storm was able to get away. But after doing that, she basically been hanging out with Gambit this entire time. And so you have the two characters heading over to the sub-basement of Charles Xavier School to kind of begin the process of finding the X-Men, her team. She has no idea what happened to them after she had supposedly died, except when she gets to that sub-basement, well, she runs into Cable in the New Mutants. Now for Storm, she has been gone for really a short period of time in comics, but she has missed a lot. The idea the X-Men are no longer around. You now have the Mere Island X-Men. You now have Cable in charge of the new mutants. Like, she has missed a lot, but she was only gone for a short period of time. There was a huge shuffle in teams, but you didn't have Cable and also Forge being able to catch her up but also when it comes to Franklin Richards. But once she hear about Franklin Richards, she's kind of like, um, he should not be around. And here is the reason why. Storm knows that Franklin died in the future. The rest of the heroes, they never knew that. But now we have to jump over to Cyclops and also Susan Storm, where you have the two characters having a conversation about Jean Grey. Now, like I said earlier, Jean Grey has a reason of why she does not like Rachel Summers. But I did say that I cannot tell you if it's good or a bad reason. It's completely up to you guys. And here is the reason why. So when it comes to Jean Grey, she hates the idea that the future is technically set for her. That she believes no matter what in the future, she's going to have to marry Cyclops and have a daughter. And for her, that's not fair. Because around this time in Marvel Comics, she's also trying to deal with the idea that there are three different personas in her mind at this moment. You have her, you have Madeline Pryor from X-Men Inferno, and you also have the Phoenix. You have all three different personalities currently battling in her mind. And so for her, she's having a hard time trying to figure out when she does like something, is it her or is it Madeline? Or is it the Phoenix? And so when it comes to Cyclops, she has no idea 
if it's her that actually loves him or is it Madeline or the Phoenix? And so she hates the idea that she feels like she has no free will. And so finding out that in a future that you get married to Cyclops and also have a daughter, it feels like, again, she has no say in what comes for her life. And so you have Cyclops wondering, why is Jean Grey acting like that? And you have Susan try her best to explain things to him. But then out of nowhere, both characters are attacked by a hap who had just randomly returned and grabs our two heroes and disappears. Now you have the rest of the heroes meet up where you have Storm explain the whole entire timeline to days of future past to the rest of the heroes because all the other characters besides her were not there when days of future past actually happened. And so you have Storm to say, listen, I was told by the future Kitty Pride and Rachel that Franklin Richard died. He died in that timeline. And so it makes no sense on how in the world he's here right now in the present day. Now you also have our heroes wondering, is Storm saying that she believed that her and the rest of her X-Men had worked alongside with future Kitty Pride and Rachel to make sure that timeline did not happen, then why do all these different characters keep appearing? It seems like that timeline is still going to happen. And so now you have our heroes kind of wondering, what is exactly going on with Franklin Richards? But they do know one thing, they have to find him, but to also save Rachel from him. Because they realize that Franklin is doing something to her as well. Now getting back over to Ahab, we kind of find out that he has turned Cyclops and Susan Storm into, or Susan Richards, into, well, hounds as well. And remember, hounds in his timeline were used to hunt down other mutants. And so once you have Cyclops and Susan become hounds, he says, listen, I need you guys to go ahead and find your children. I want to find Rachel and also Franklin. Now, when it comes to Susan, she's able to locate both of her kids. Now, the problem is, well, not really a problem. It's that they have only wants one of them. He wants the adult one, not the young one. Now, when it comes to Cyclops, he tells Ahab, I cannot locate Rachel for you at all. Now, for Ahab, he realized that Cyclops is not lying, but he does know that Franklin and Rachel are in love. If you find one, you'll find the other. And so you have Ahab use Susan as his hound to locate Franklin and Rachel Summers. And so now we jump over to Franklin and Rachel who are having a picnic, just minding their business, but they have a baby with them. Now this baby is of course, Nathan Summers. So now we know that he is perfectly okay, but for Franklin, he's wondering why is Rachel so okay with the past being different than it was in their timeline? Because like I said earlier, in their timeline, there was no Nathan Summers, but she says miracles can happen. Maybe when we went back in time the first time, we did change the past. And yes, our future could still happen, but now our future could involve him and also me, siblings together. But for Franklin, that's not right at all. That in his time, in their time, there was no Nathan. Now, why you have the two talking to one another, that is when you have a Hab appear. And when he does appear, he is able to use his own powers to take down both Franklin and Rachel Summers. And so now they are his prisoners. Now with Rachel Summers and also Franklin Richards being prisoners for a Hab, you didn't have the rest of the heroes arrive. X-Factor, X-Men, the New Mutants, and also the Fantastic Four. Everyone is there to work together to bring down this one character. Now, the battle is really short-lived because you have to have been able to use some kind of device to take all our heroes out at once. Now, when it comes to Storm, she is able to make it over to Franklin Richards to wake him up. And as soon as she does, he realizes what he has to do. So when it comes to Franklin, he gets rid of all machines that belong to Ahab. Those machines were giving him the ability to stay in this reality. And so with those machines gone, he has no choice 
but to go back to his own reality. Now, before he leaves, he tries to take Rachel Summers with him, but she says no. Now, after getting that answer, he tries to kill her off, but luckily Jean Grey protects Rachel Summers. Now, before he leaves, he says one last line. He says, I know how the war ends. Whatever you do to me now, you'll still meet me in the days to come. And then he leaves back into his own time. But now it's time for us to get the answers on what in the world is going on when it comes to Franklin Richards. Now, when it comes to Storm, she realized that this is a ghost. Let me explain. So like I said earlier, the adult Franklin, he did die in the original story, Days of Future Past. He died in that book, except apparently when he did die, he was able to send a shadow version of himself back in time where he felt the most safe. And apparently that was when he was a child. And so the shadow version of himself right now is basically a ghost of Franklin Richards from the future that had traveled back in time and had automatically connected to the present day Franklin. And he has been using the powers of present day Franklin to stay around, but to also change reality around him to what he remembered from his timeline. And so, as long as he stays here, the young Franklin, our Franklin, will not be able to wake up from his coma. But at the same time, he's also been holding on to the powers of the Phoenix as well. And so you have the hero saying, you're just a ghost. Like, you're not the real Franklin from that time. Like, you need to go away to allow our Franklin a chance to survive, but to also give the power of the Phoenix back over to Rachel Summers. And so, he has no choice but to say goodbye, which he does, but you can tell that it hurts Rachel a lot. But she is able to regain the abilities of the Phoenix, but also young Franklin... He now is out of his coma and he's back to normal. Now the same power that was released from the adult Franklin also turned Cyclops and uh, Susan back into their regular forms. They're no longer hounds anymore. Now when it comes to Rachel, she does change back into her hound outfit she wore back in the present day of her timeline. Or really, what she wears sometimes here and there in Marvel Comics. But when she does show this form off, you have Jean Grey kind of freak out to see how Rachel looks. But also, Rachel is embarrassed on how she's looking right now because when she was a hound, she did a lot of horrible things. And she hates the idea of seeing her mom being kind of judgmental towards how she looks. And so you have Rachel leave and no one really stops her. Now the book kind of ends on the idea of the teens going their separate ways, but you do have X Factor telling Storm and Forge and Banshee that they're gonna help them find the rest of the X-Men to reform the team. And so this leads us into the next era for X-Men comics which then leads us into the next crossover that we are going to talk about very soon on this channel. What's going on there, YouTube? And welcome back to another comic book video. Okay, so we are finally here, guys. We are finally going to dive into the extension agenda. And really, it's only been a week since we had covered Days of Future Present. The last crossover, we talked about the X-Men on my channel. But now it's time for the next X-Men crossover. Now, when it comes to the extension agenda, you got X-Factor, you got the New Mutants, you got the X-Men. They're all here again for another massive crossover now here's the thing this entire story arc is about our heroes going up against the country known as genosha now we have actually talked about genosha in the 
earlier parts of our coverage over the X-Men. Now, when it comes to Genosha, it's this small country in Africa, the small island in Africa, where they advertise the idea that they are a perfect country. That if you go there, you don't want to leave because how great it is to be in that country. But in reality, if you are a mutant and you go over there, you are automatically going to be turned into a slave to help build up their economy. Now, the rest of the world, they had no idea that Genosha was doing that. But the X-Men found out because some of their own team members were actually taken over to Genosha and the rest of the team had to go save them. But also they free some of the slaves in the country. Now, the slaves they free, it was a very small number. But for Genosha, it's still a problem. And so to them, they call that an attack against their country. The X-Men had attacked their country, even though what they are doing is technically wrong. And so right now, it's Genosha saying, we are coming after the X-Men for what they did to our country. Now, when it comes to the American government, they're going to get involved, but I'm going to save that for later on in this video. First, I want to focus on the X-Men. Now, the opening pages of this book does remind us that around this time in Marvel Comics, Storm was actually a child again. She was de-aged back into a child, thanks to, well, a character known as the Nanny. Now, when it comes to the Nanny, she is this very interesting character where she had this belief where she had to go out of her way to help protect other people now at first it was children but then down the road it was young adults now when it came to Storm, she realized that Storm had too much willpower to allow her to take over her mind. And so you had the nanny turn Storm back into a child again. And so after doing that, she was hoping to take over the mind of Storm. But unfortunately, her plan did not work out. Now, we see Storm in the danger room with Jean Grey. And the reason why? Because the X-Men and the New Mutants are trying to figure out where Storm is at right now when it comes to her powers. Because yes, even though she has been de-aged into a child, she still has the mindset of a grown woman. But her powers are now brought back down to the point where she would first receive her powers as a teenager. And so they're trying to see how strong she was back then when she had first received her powers. Now in the danger room, this is also her and Jean Grey rebuilding their connection once again. Because before Jean Grey was supposedly the Phoenix and Dark Phoenix, Storm and Jean were very close. But even after Jean came back to life, it took a very long time for these two characters to sit down with one another and rebuild their bond with one another. But right now, you have the two being able to see where is Storm actually yet when it comes to her powers, while you have Forge, Banshee, and also Stevie Hunter kind of seeing where else Storm could possibly go with her powers. Now, something else I do want to talk about is the New Mutants. You see, around this time in X-Men comics, they were being led by a character known as Cable. Now, here's the thing. Their base is currently the sub-basement to Charles Xavier School. And matter of fact, around this time in X-Men comics, the school is no longer around. It got blown up back in X-Men Inferno by Mr. Sinister but a sub-basement was actually able to stay intact. And the new mutants, well, they moved in with their new team leader, Cable. And the problem is right now, Storm, Banshee, and Forge, they're X-Men. They're not new mutants. And it seemed like they're trying to move in and take over the place. And for Cable, that is not okay at all. The X-Men had left by this point. The basement was abandoned. The new mutants have moved in. It's their place now. And so for Cable, he's very upset about the idea that now he has to share his home with the X-Men again, even though it was his first. And now the danger room cannot be used as freely as it was before they arrived. 
But now I want to jump back over to Jean Grey and Storm. And here is the reason why. So you have the two characters right now having a conversation with one another about the idea that over the years of being X-Men, they both have went on to a point where the world believed that they were dead. But in reality, they had survived or they were just in hiding. But they were able to come back into their lives and pick up where they left off at. And that is really important when it comes to the extension agenda. And here is the reason why. So while you have Storm and Jean Grey being able to have a convo with one another about that actual topic, once you have Jean Grey leave, will you have Storm be confronted by Wolfbane? Now, for Wolfbane, she's very upset with Storm for one particular reason. Fall of the Mutants. Let me explain. So back in that crazy event for the X-Men, you had each X-Men team deal with their own kind of problems. The main X-Men team, they had to deal with the idea of a character known as the Adversary. Now, when it came to the Adversary, he was trying to come into the main Marvel Universe reality. But our heroes were able to give up their lives as a way to keep him out of their reality. But the problem was, though, they did it on live television. And so to the entire world, the X-Men had died that day. But in reality, they were brought back to life by Lady Roma. Now, when it came to the X-Men, they said, you know what? Let's stay dead to the rest of the world. Let's hide in the shadow because if we do that, it gives us the ability to go after other characters without them knowing we're coming after them. Now, in Fall of the Mutants, for the new mutants, they had a different problem. They had to deal with the idea of losing one of their own. Cypher. He died in that crossover. And so for Cypher's death, it played a huge role for the new mutants. And for Wolfbane, that is why she's so upset for. Because the X-Men technically never did die and then came back around like nothing ever happened. But for Cypher, he is unable to come back to life. And for her, it's not fair that Jean Grey and the X-Men are able to just come back like nothing ever happened, to continue on with their lives. But someone like Cypher, a young mutant, was unable to live his entire life because he was part of their superhero team and he got killed off by some crazy bad guy. Now it's time for us to get into the good part where you have the X-Men get attacked by the Magistrate. Now remember, the Magistrate is really more of the military force for Genosha. And so when they arrive, they come all gun blazing. They are ready to capture Storm, Boom Boom, Wolfbane, Warlock, and Stevie Hunter. The rest of our heroes are currently in the sub-basement. And here's the thing, you have Storm being able to get Stevie Hunter down the hatch that leads into the sub-basement. But then the hatch is sealed shut. And that is a huge problem. Because now the rest of our heroes in the sub-basement, they can't leave in the usual way. They now have to go the back way if they want to be able to help their friends out against the magistrate. But the problem is the back way is going to take them a whole lot longer than the usual route. And so on the surface, it's now just Storm. Warlock, Wolfbane, and Boom Boom going up against the Magistrate. And the thing is, they lose very quickly. Now, when it comes to Storm, she also finds out that one of the soldiers of the Magistrate is Havoc. And we have not seen Havoc since the whole Siege Perilous part of the recent X-Men stories that we had covered. Because you had the X-Men go through the Siege Perilous. And usually when it comes to the Siege Perilous, it is able to give you a new life, a new beginning in the world. But the problem is, you may forget about where you came from in your new life. And so when it came to most of the X-Men, we knew what happened to them, but we had no idea what exactly happened to Havoc. And now we know, apparently his new life was in Genosha, and he began to work for the Magistrate, and now helping them to bring down his old friends. But he has no idea that he is attacking his old friends. But either way, Storm, Boom Boom, 
Warlock and also uh, Wolfbane, they're all captured and taken away. And so as we dive into the second chapter, we now pick up with our heroes who were captured by the Magistrate now being prisoners for Genosha. Now, when it comes to Storm, she is going to be put on trial because she was part of the X-Men that went over to Genosha. Now, for Boom Boom and Wolfbane, they should not be on trial at all. And here's the reason why. Because they were not part of the X-Men when the X-Men had went over to Genosha the first time. But because they're one, they're mutants, and two, they have ties with Storm, unfortunately, they're also going to be put on trial as well. Now, we also kind of find out that a certain character is not dead. That would be Cameron Hodge. Now, the last time we saw him was back in X-Men Inferno, where he had his head clean cut off by Archangel. But because this man made a deal with the demon known as Nastir, he gained immortality. And so his head had traveled all the way over to Genosha, where he was able to work his way up to a government position. And so it's him right now leading the charge to go after the X-Men. Now, let's not forget, when it comes to Cameron Hodge, he was also the leader of the right. And the right, they hated mutants. And this man most definitely hated mutants. He wanted to get rid of them. And so being able to join Genosha to turn mutants into slaves or to possibly kill them was right up his alley. Now, getting back over to the rest of our heroes, when they arrive to the surface level of the school, they see that their teammates have already been taken. Now, for Cable, he is very upset with Storm because now he believes that Storm had purposely sealed the hatch shut, which then cut off their chances to arrive in time to help out their fellow teammates. Now, for Forge, it's kind of like, dude, even though she did do that, she's also gone along with your students. And so now we have to work together if we're going to be able to find her and your students. So stop trying to blame her and try to work with us. Now, you have Stevie tell us and her team that, hey, listen, I called in X Factor. They should be here very soon to help out with this situation. Now, getting back over to Cameron Hodge, I just realized that I did mention that, yes, even though he did gain immortality, this man also was given a new body because, again, Archangel had cut his head off, but without a body, you can't do much with a head. And so you had Genosha being able to build him a robot body for him to use. Now, when it comes to Cameron Hodge, he also got some big plans for himself down the road and those plans involve warlock now when it comes to storm boom boom and wolfbane they're unable to use their abilities thanks to another mutant that works for genosha and that'll be a character known as wipeout now when it comes to wipeout well he has the ability to wipe out your powers so that's why our heroes cannot use their abilities to fight against cameron and to try to get away now, there is another character we have to talk about, and that would be David Moreau. Now, when it comes to David, he was the original bad guy from Genosha that the X-Men fought against the last time they were on this island. You see, when it came to David, he was able to build a test for the country. You see, anytime somebody turned 13 years old, they were given this test to see if they had the X gene. If they had the X gene, meaning that they were a mutant, they would basically be brainwashed and turned into a slave for the country. And that was his job for the entire country. Now, the last time the X-Men came here, well, they caused a lot of problems with him. And so, yes, even though he's down to get payback against the X-Men, he's also very upset with Cameron Hodge. And here's why. Because he finds out that Cameron has taken Warlock into his own personal lab. Now, he believes that Warlock is also a mutant like Storm, Boom Boom, and Wolfbane, not knowing that Warlock is not really a mutant. He's an alien. And so you have Cameron saying, listen, Warlock is not a mutant. He will not be a slave for our country. Instead, I'm going to use Warlock 
for something completely different. Now, when it comes to Warlock, he realized that Cameron and also David are too busy having a conversation to notice that he's going to try to sneak away, which he is able to do. Now, I just realized that I did not mention that Richter is also a prisoner as well, alongside with Storm boom boom and wolfbang now when it comes to richter there is a lot of bad blood between him and also cameron hodge because cameron did the man dirty in the early days of x factor comics he was actually a prisoner of the right either way when it comes to warlock once he gets back to the cell he is able to depower the cell to allow our heroes to escape but here's the problem though Warlock used too much energy to depower the cell down, and so unfortunately, he no longer has the ability to travel with them, and they have to leave him behind, which honestly, he is okay with that idea because at least they're able to get the heck out of there and to find a way to contact their teams to save the day. And so he says, leave me behind, but hopefully I'll be able to meet back up with you. Now for Wolfbane, this is going to be a problem. Because after a while, while you have our heroes trying their best to find a way out of this whole building, you didn't have Wolfbane and Richter split up. Now, by this point, Wolfbane and Richter are actually a couple. She was able to move on from the idea of Cypher's death and find new love, which is Richter. But right now, she's very worried about Warlock. And she says, listen, go ahead, go without me. I'm going to go back and try to save Warlock which he does try. Now, when it comes to Cameron Hodge, the reason why he wants Warlock so bad is because Warlock has the ability to give other people the transmode virus. Now, the transmode virus technically turns someone into a techno-organic being. And for Cameron, he wants to be that because once you become that kind of being, you are really powerful. And so he's trying his best to actually fuse with Warlock to gain the transmode virus. But the problem is, Wolfbane gets involved. She tries her best to save Warlock. But while doing that, something happens to the point where you have Warlock just disappear. But unfortunately for Cameron Hodge, he now lost his chance to be able to fuse with Warlock. And for Wolfbane, even though she tried to save Warlock, she technically did stop him from being able to fuse with Cameron Hodge, but now he disappeared. And so we're left to believe that he's also now dead. He's also gone. And for Wolfbane, that hurts a lot. She lost somebody else that she cared for. Now, when it comes to Genosha, they do make an announcement about the idea that they had killed off Warlock. You see, they're saying that they were able to capture some of the mutants of the X-Men who had committed crimes against their country. Now, when it came to Warlock, he tried to escape. And unfortunately, it led to his death. But the rest of their prisoners are still around. And they show a picture of Wolfbane on live television for the entire world to see. Now, by this point, X-Factor, the rest of X-Men minus three characters and the new mutants are all there watching TV together. And now they know that Genosha has taken their friends and now they are prisoners. They also now know that Warlock is dead and are now wondering what could possibly happen to the rest of their team. Now, as we get into the third chapter, this is where we have the government kind of get involved in this story arc. So when it comes to the president of Genosha, she does go to meet up with Cameron Hodge. And you have Cameron kind of give her a congratulations because she basically showed the world that Genosha is not a weak country. They are a very strong country. And when you try to go against them like a terrorist attack, you pay for those crimes. And so when it comes to Warlock, yes, they did kill him off, but because Warlock does have some ties with the X-Men, it's kind of like, no, Warlock died because his ties with the X-Men, the terrorist group that attacked us many months ago. This is us saying that this is what happens when you try to attack us. And the rest of our prisoners, Storm, 
Boom Boom, Wolfbane, and Richter, they're also going to be executed. Now, when it comes to David, he also walks into the room and he is very upset because right now, he looks like a fool. Really not just him, but the entire country because technically the other prisoners had escaped. And right now they have the ability of getting out. And if they do get out, it could bring more problems for this country. Now for the president, she tells them, listen, we have to work with Cameron Hodge here because he has the ability to give us what we want. Now we have no idea what she is talking about, but we can tell it's something very important. So even though Karen right now is completely insane, they have to work with him. Now, when it comes to the rest of our heroes like X-Factor, the New Mutants, and also the X-Men, they're heading over to the White House to talk to Val Cooper. Now, Val Cooper, she is in charge of the superhuman affairs for the country. But right now, it's Cyclops and the rest of his team right now wondering what to do here because why would Genosha cause an international incident like this? And also, what would happen for our heroes if they get involved? Because technically right now, this is between two countries, America and Genosha. But America cannot get involved for a very special reason. And that would be money. Let me explain. So when it comes to America, they owe Genosha a lot of money. And I'm talking like possibly millions or billions of dollars. And so Val Cooper, she said, we cannot get involved because technically we are in debt with that country. If we get involved, it could cause a whole lot more problems with us and other countries down the road. And so for America, really Val Cooper, she's saying, listen, we're going to give you the ability to go over to Genosha to get your teammates back. But we are unofficially helping you out. But in reality, we are helping you out by giving you a ton of information that could possibly help you once you do arrive over in Genosha. But like I said, you cannot say that you have the backing of America because technically you don't. But in reality, you do because what they are doing right now is completely wrong. Yes, you may be mutants, but you're still looked as American citizens. And so when they went out of their way to kidnap those heroes, they kidnapped fellow Americans. And that is a huge problem. So here's all this info and hopefully you were able to use it to find a way to save your friends, but to also bring down Genosha. Now, once you have our heroes arrive to Genosha, well, that is when they are attacked by the magistrate. Now, for our heroes, Cameron Hodge knew that they were coming because again, he knew that sooner or later, they would come to save their fellow teammates. But his main goal is to take out the mutant race, but his main, main goal is to go after Archangel because Archangel had cut off his head back in X-Men Inferno. Now, when our heroes arrive on Genosha, they are attacked by the magistrate that's being led by Havoc. Now, Havoc, he's the first one to attack our heroes. Really, he attacks Cyclops. Now, when it comes to Cyclops, he's kind of like, hmm, that blast should have done some damage to me. But unfortunately, I am okay. Not unfortunately, really, fortunately, I am okay. But the thing is, my clothes are completely ruined. Now, for Cyclops, he turns around and blasts Havoc right back. Now, at first, he has no idea that he's fighting against Havoc. But after a while, he realized if my powers are not working on this person and his powers are now working on me, that means it's my own brother. And of course, he was right. It's Havoc. And you have the two guys fighting against each other. Now, Cyclops has no idea that when it came to the X-Men, they had walked through the Siege Perilous. And like I said earlier, the Siege Perilous has the ability to give you a new life, a new beginning. But sometimes you may forget about your past life. And so for Havoc, he has forgotten about his past life. He has no idea who he is or the rest of the people around him. He believes that he's actually a citizen of Genosha, that he's actually part of their 
country. And so he goes up against Cyclops. But once you have Scott being able to say a few words to Alex, he begins to remember. But the problem is his new life, his new idea of life is fighting against his old life. And so unfortunately, he has to retreat. And he says, hey, get me the heck out of there. And him and his entire army just disappears. But to leave us on a cliffhanger, we're left to wonder what's going to happen to all our different heroes. Cyclops just found out that his brother is helping out Genosha. Wolfbane is now a prisoner again. Warlock is now possibly dead. Richter, Storm, and the rest of them are trying their best get out of the Citadel. And Cameron Hodge, he is not done yet with our heroes. But in our next video, we're going to have three more characters arrive into this huge crossover. That will be Wolverine, Psylocke, and also Jubilee. But this is where... What's going on there, YouTube, and welcome back to another comic book video. Okay, so we are going to continue our coverage over the extension agenda. And guys, it gets even crazier because now we actually pick up with Wolverine and Psylocke and also Jubilee getting involved in this event as well. Also, we're going to see Cameron Hodge being able to take down Cable and a few other members of the X-Men, X-Factor, and the New Mutants. And also, there's going to be some drama between Wolverine and Jean Grey which could possibly make Cyclops a very angry man. And so getting into today's video, we do pick up with Uncanny X-Men number 271, where we actually pick up with Richter and also Boom Boom on the run. Because remember, they were able to get away from Cameron Hodge, but unfortunately, they had to split away from, well, Storm and also Wolfbane. And those two characters are currently being held by Cameron Hodge and the Magistrate. Now, when it comes to Richter and Boom Boom, they're on the run. They're trying to get away from the Magistrate, the police force for Genosha. But luckily for the two young heroes, Wolverine, Jubilee, and Psylocke appear. Now, you're probably wondering, hey, why can't Richter or Boom Boom use their abilities to help out Wolverine, Jubilee, and also Psylocke? Because, remember, back in the first three chapters of our coverage over the extension agenda, they lost their abilities thanks to another mutant known as Wipeout, who has the ability to cancel your powers out until he feels like turning them back on. And so for Richter and Boom Boom, they're kind of just having to run away to allow Wolverine, Psylocke, and Jubilee take care of the Magistrate. Now, once you have our three heroes being able to do that, you then have the entire group regroup. Now, when it comes to Psylocke, she does use her abilities to read the minds of Richter and Boom Boom to kind of help her and also Logan know what exactly happened so far when it came to Storm, Wolfbane, Boom Boom, Richter, and Warlock. And so now our other heroes know that Storm and Wolfbane are still being held hostage. Warlock is dead, but Richter and Boom Boom, they were able to get away. Now, when it comes to Logan, he said, listen, you two are going to stay with Jubilee because one, you guys no longer have your powers, but two, she still does, which means she can protect y'all and hopefully get y'all somewhere safe. Psylocke and I we're going to go back and get Storm and Wolfbane and find you guys later on. Now, when it comes to Richter and also Boom Boom, they kind of want to go with them. But Logan says, again, you don't have your powers. You can't help us at all. Go with Jubilee, go somewhere safe, and we'll find you guys later. Now, we jump over to David Moreau. Now, when it comes to David, he was the one who had created the entire process where you had Genosha testing out people at the age of 13 to see if they were a mutant or not. Now, if they were a mutant, that means they become a slave in Genosha. But if they are not a mutant, then they are able to continue on with their lives like nothing ever happened. Now, when it comes to David, he's right now having a live debate on live television against 
more Mittagger. Now let's not forget, in the last few story arcs that we had covered, more Mittagger has been somewhat more aggressive towards other people. Now, in this debate, she is angry like no other. But honestly, she has the right to be angry because she says, how dare you guys kidnap four children? Wolfbane, Boom Boom, Richter, Warlock. They are children and you took them to your country to put them on trial for crimes that they did not commit. Now for David, he said, but that's the problem though. One, they are mutants. And two, they have ties with the X-Men. And that right there is good enough for us. But for more, that's not fair. Because you're now saying that if somebody has a connection with someone else and that person then commits crime, then the original person is also in trouble because they know that person, even though they did not commit the crime at all. And so when it comes to Richter, Boom Boom, Warlock, and also Wolfbane, they're being put on trial for crimes they did not commit at all. That is not fair at all. Yes, for Storm, maybe, but the others is not cool. But either way, for David and Genosha to kind of like, and what's your point? Like, we're coming after every single person that may have some kind of connection to the X-Men. And right now, we have five of your people. Storm, Richter, Boom Boom, Warlock, and Wolfbane. Now, we see David go to his office. Now, when it comes to David, we also get reminded that this man had a son. His son name is Philip Moreau. Now, he's still alive, yes, but Philip ran away from Genosha once he found out what his father was doing in the country, turning innocent mutants into slaves. Now, when it came to Philip, the only reason why he had a change of heart is because his girlfriend, Jennifer. When they found out that she was a mutant, they were going to turn her into a slave as well. And so you had the X-Men being able to get Philip and Jennifer away from Genosha. Now, while you have David in his office, he's then confronted by Storm. Now, this is Storm going for blood. She's kind of like, how dare you kidnap us? How dare you kill off Warlock? How dare you do almost everything you did to me and the rest of the mutants on this island? Now, when it comes to David, he says, Storm, you don't understand. I'm not your main target. Cameron Hodge should be. And the reason why? Because that man got plans to not just wipe you guys out, but to wipe out all mutants across the world. But the problem is, before you have David being able to tell Storm everything she needs to know, Cameron Hodge walks into the room. Now remember, when it comes to Cameron, he now has this super advanced robotic body because back in X-Men Inferno, Archangel cut off his head, but he was able to survive because he made a deal with a demon. And so because of that, he was able to just stay alive and be given a new robotic body. But this body is so advanced and also because Storm does not have her powers that she is easily taken out by him. And so now she has been recaptured by Cameron. But getting back over to Wolverine and also Psylocke, they're trying to reach the Citadel to hopefully say Storm and Wolfbane just in time. But the problem is you have Psylocke screaming out in pain. And the reason why? Because she now has a connection to Storm's mind. And with that connection, she now knows that Storm is going through a lot of pain. They are beginning the process of turning Storm into a slave. And once Storm becomes a slave, she will not remember anything about her past life. She will be completely brainwashed. Now, the last few pages for this chapter, a lot of stuff happens, but oh my God, it's completely crazy. So you have Wolverine and Psylocke being able to sneak into the Citadel, but then blow their cover when they realize that one of the members of the Magistrate is also Havoc. Alex Summers. Now remember, when it came to the X-Men after Rogue had disappeared in the Siege Perilous, the rest of the X-Men minus Wolverine had also walked through the Siege Perilous. Now when it comes to the Siege Perilous, it has the ability to give you a new life. Now this new life is not promising saying like, oh, you have a good new life. 
it could be a bad new life. But also in your new life, you may forget about your past one. And so for Havoc, he arrived in Genosha not remembering anything about his past life. But on top of that, this man truly believes that he came here from Genosha. And so right now, he's working for the magistrates, their police force, their army force. And so when it comes to Wolverine and also Psylocke, he's fighting against them. But also so now is Cameron Hodge and his super advanced robotic body. And really, thanks to his new body, he is able to take down Wolverine and Psylocke. Now, they tried their best to continue on, but unfortunately, they are knocked out by Storm. And we see Storm has gone through the process completely. She has now been officially brainwashed and now a slave for Genosha. Now, we jump into New Mutants number 96, where we actually pick up with Richter, Boom Boom, and Jubilee on the run. Now, when it comes to Genosha, they do make an announcement saying, hey, we were able to grab Wolverine and Psylocke. They're now our prisoners. But the other two prisoners, Boom Boom and Richter, they're still on the run. And we're trying our best to hunt them down. And now that includes Jubilee as well. Now, when it comes to our young heroes, they're trying their best to hide, but to also make it over to where X-Factor, the new mutants, and the X-Men could be yet. But the problem is, they're being followed by the Magistrate, who are now using mutants who have the ability to hunt down other mutants. And matter of fact, you have a few members of the Magistrate being able to find our young heroes. Now, when it comes to our heroes, they are able to take down those few members of the Magistrate, but they were able to call in backup. And so, for our young heroes, plans have changed. They can no longer run over to X-Factor to the New Mutants or the X-Men because right now they are going to be followed by an army of Magistry. And that could be too much for our other heroes to actually handle at this point in time. But now we have to jump over to X-Factor and the rest of the X-Men and the New Mutants. Now when it comes to Cyclops and the rest of his crew, they're finding out that Wolverine and Psylocke are now prisoners of Genosha. And so for Cyclops, he's kind of like, great, we got to save them as well. Now, when it comes to Scott Summers, this man always got a plan. Like this man knows what he has to do to make sure that his team is going to be successful. So he said, hey guys, listen, we are going to split up into two teams. If your powers do not make that much noise, you are going to be team A. Team B is everyone else who powers do make a lot of noise. And team A is going to basically set bombs across the Citadel. And hopefully those bombs can bring down the entire building, but also give us the ability to save our friends and other prisoners who are being kept inside that building. Now, when it comes to Cyclops, hmm, when it comes to Cyclops, he told everyone that's the plan. But this man got a secret plan that he plans to bring out later on in this event. Now, I want to jump back over to Cameron Hodge because this man is ticked off about the idea that he has not received any word about what happened to the X-Men, X-Factor, or the New Mutants when they had arrived onto Genosha. The last thing he heard was that he sent Havoc and also the Magistrate to go take them down, to capture them, except Havoc came back empty-handed. Why? Because Havoc left the battle. Why? Because he freaked out. Once you ask God say, hey, what are you doing, Alex? Like, you're my brother, you're a mutant, and you were an X-Men. You're not from Genosha at all. And so for Havoc, he's really thinking about the idea that what God said could possibly be true. Now, when it comes to uh, Cameron, he finds out that David is about to turn Wolfbane into a slave. Now, like I said earlier, when it comes to a mutant being turned into a slave, they are completely brainwashed. And so for Cameron, he says, listen, before you brainwash her, I want to tell you right now, I want a small part of her to always remember that it was me 
who basically turned her into this. It was me who was able to capture her and turn her into a slave. Now, for David, he says, that is a bad idea because that small part of her could be the end to all of us. Something big could happen down the road because she will remember that it was you who did this to her. Now, we jump back over to Jubilee, Richter, and also um, Boom Boom. I forgot about her completely. And you have all three characters head over to an apartment that is technically empty. No one's there at the moment. So they are able to go through the fridge to get some food to eat. But the problem is the owner of the apartment comes home. And that owner is actually a member of the magistrate. Now, he also has a tracker with him as well. Now, once you have our heroes being able able to bring down that member of the magistrate he then tells Richter that hey man listen Wolfbane is now a slave and that ticks Richter off a lot because remember Richter and Wolfbane around this time in Marvel Comics had just begun dating one another and so to find out that the woman he loves is now a slave for Genosha he wants to rush right back in there to go save her now you have Jubilee and Boom Boom say have you lost your mind like if you rush in there most likely you are going to get recaptured but for Richter he does not care he wants to save Wolfbane he loves her now you have Jubilee say you know what I'll go with you and so does Boom Boom but also the mutant that was used earlier as a tracker it kind of shows that he's now beginning the process of moving away from his programming that David gave him earlier now I want to give back over to Cable and the reason why because his team had arrived at the Citadel but their main goal is to place bombs across the entire building to bring it down now when it comes to Cable's team is Cable, Gambit, Forge, Jean Grey, and Sunspot. But here's the thing, while you have our heroes trying to do that, they get caught by the Magistrate. Now, while you have our heroes fighting against the Magistrate, Richter, Jubilee, and also Boom Boom arrived as well. Now for Jubilee, she wants to jump into the battle, but you have Richter say, don't do that because there is another mutant out there known as Wipeout and he has the ability to wipe out your powers. So if you go out there, you're going to end up powerless along with them. And matter of fact, right when he says that, bam, there goes our hero's powers. Cable, powerless. Jean Grey, powerless. Forge, powerless. Sunspot, powerless. They're all completely powerless. And so for Jubilee, she realized what Richter said is actually true. Except at the end of this chapter, at the end of this chapter, we see that Wolfbane is a slave. And you have the rest of her friends also realize that they now lost Wolfbane as well. That she is a slave. But Cable and his team, without their powers, they're now also prisoners as well for Cameron Hodge. Now, we jump over to X-Factor number 61. But in the opening pages of this book, I want to shift our focus over to Jean Grey. And here is the reason why. So, when it comes to Jean Grey, she's having a hard time believing in the idea that Cameron Hodge is actually a bad guy. Now, for me personally, I'm kind of like, why? Because you fought against him multiple times by this point in Marvel Comics. But for her, she still cannot believe any idea that he is a bad guy because in the early days of X-Factor Comics, he did work alongside with the team, except the entire time he was there, he was plotting their downfall because he was a jealous man. He hated Archangel because back in their college days where they were supposedly best friends, Archangel got everything. He had more money. He had a nice car, the nice clothes, the women. And so for Cameron, he was a very jealous man. But once he found out that Warren was actually a mutant, that was enough for him to hate all mutants across the world. But either way, you do have Cameron go ahead and beat down on all the members of Cable's team. Now, when it comes to our heroes, they're all powerless. But Forge, 
for some unknown reason, is completely knocked out, and no one knows why he is knocked out. Now, while you have our heroes being transported over to their cells, they see Wolfbane, and they realize that she is a slave. Now, they did get word that she was a slave, but they had a hard time believing in the idea that she actually became a slave. But now they see her, they now know it's the actual truth. Now for Cable, he hates the idea of seeing her as a slave because again, for Cable, he is now the teacher of the new mutants. He is trying his best to protect them. And so right now, he feels like he failed when it came to protecting her. And so he tries to go after Karen Hodge. Now at first, it does look like maybe he might be able to do something, but again, Cameron's body is just so advanced that he was able to bring Cable back down once again and continue to take our heroes to their new cells. Now, I want to jump over to Cyclops, and here is the reason why. So, when it comes to Cyclops, like I said earlier, this man got plans on plans on plans. So, this man knew that sooner or later, Cable and his team would get captured, but he also knew that their minds could be read by Karen Hodge using other mutants who have psychic abilities. And so for Cyclops, he now knows that him and his team, they have to leave. But they are going to leave a nice surprise for the small force of Magistrate coming here to look for them. Now, when it comes to Cyclops, he also tells us that he had a different plan in mind, but no one else knew this plan except him and Forge. And apparently right now, Forge is faking the idea of being knocked out as part of their plan. Now, when it comes to Cameron Hodge, this man got plans as well to go after Cyclops. And really, he knows how to attack Cyclops by using Jean Grey. Because everyone knows that Cyclops and Jean Grey, that they are lovers. They are a couple. But Jean Grey has another lover, and that would be Wolverine. And so, when you have Jean Grey arrive into her new cell, well, Logan is there as well. Now, something else I should mention is that when it comes to Logan around this time in Marvel Comics, well, his healing factor wasn't as strong as it is now in modern day comics. So, for Logan, this man has gone through a lot, but unfortunately, he has not been given the time to properly heal like he needs. And so, unfortunately, this man is still severely injured. And so, when Jean Grey finds him, she's kind of like, oh my god, this man is literally on the verge of death. But in the short period of time with Jean Grey and Logan being in the same room, they are able to pick up where they left off at to kind of show that they still have strong feelings for one another and they actually kiss one another. Now, while they're kissing, Karen Hodge is watching and he does plan on using this as a way to attack Cyclops. Now, for Karen Hodge, he still believes in the idea that sooner or later, he should be able to capture every single member of the X-Men, X-Factor, and the New Mutants because right now, a small army of the Magistrate is about to hit the base that Cyclops' team was using. Here's the thing though, when they arrive at that base, the base gets blown up. Now at first, we're left to believe that it was the Magistrate who had blew up the base to try to kill off Cyclops and his team, but something else actually happened. Because while you have Cameron Hodge talking to the president of Genosha and also David Moreau, well that is when you have Archangel, Cannonball, and Banshee arrive. Now. This is only three members of Cyclops' team. The rest of his team is somewhere else right now in the Citadel. Now, when it comes to Archangel, he is very surprised to see Cameron because, again, back in X-Men Inferno, it was Archangel who had killed off Cameron Hodge. He cut the man's head off. But as we all know, he made a deal with a demon. And so he was able to have immortality. And Genosha gave him a brand new body. And so now he's here again, being able to fight against Archangel. And unfortunately for our heroes, even though their main goal was to cause a distraction long enough to allow Cyclops, Iceman, and Beast to pull off Cyclops' secret plan, 
they get captured by Cameron Hodge and Genosha. And really, the ending of this chapter is a perfect cliffhanger for today's video because when it comes to Cyclops and Iceman, they're right now pretending to be mutants who are slaves to Genosha. And right now, they are transporting another mutant over to a different facility, except the mutant they're currently transporting is actually Beast, who's pretending to be unconscious. But the problem is they run into some guards who want to make sure that everything is okay. And honestly, their cover gets completely blown. Now, as soon as their cover gets blown, well, that is when the trap doors begin to come down from the roof, or the ceiling, sorry. And so when the trap doors come down, they cut off Beast and Iceman from Cyclops. And so now it's Cyclops on his own, except when he turns around, he's then confronted by Havoc. Now, when it comes to Cyclops, he tries again to convince his brother that they are actually brothers, that Alex is an X-Men, that Alex is actually a mutant that's not from Genosha. And really, when it comes to Cyclops, he's actually able to have Alex remember everything from his past life. But the problem is, that's when Cameron Hodge walks into the room. Now, when it comes to Alex, he knows if Cameron figures out that Alex does remember everything, then Cameron is going to take out both Scott and Alex. And so you have Havoc say, you know what? Let me go ahead and continue to pretend that I have no idea what Scott is talking about and take Scott out to protect him, but to also protect me. But down the road, I'll find a way to free my friends and family. And this is where we are going to end today's comic book video because now Cyclops is technically a prisoner and we have no idea if that was part of his plan. But even What's going on there, YouTube? Welcome back to another comic book video. Okay, so we're going to really wrap up our coverage over the extension agenda. And now we pick up with the last three chapters of this crossover. Now, before we actually dive into this crossover, I kind of want to do a quick rundown of why we have this nine-part crossover in X-Men comics. You see, a while back in an earlier story arc in Uncanny X-Men, you had the X-Men men had a few members of their team become prisoners in Genosha. Now, when it came to Genosha, it was a small country in Africa, a small island near Africa where they tried to paint this picture that they were the perfect country, that it was paradise there. If you go there, you do not want to leave at all. But in reality, if you were a mutant, you were a slave. And they used your abilities as a way to build of their economy and that was the big thing about Genosha now when it came to the X-Men they were able to save a few of their team members who were prisoners in that country but also save other prisoners as well not all of them but a few of them now that was a while back but here's the thing though you see, there was another character out there known as Cameron Hodge. Now, the last time we saw Cameron was back in X-Men Inferno, where you actually had Archangel be able to cut his head off. Now, when it came to Cameron, he made a deal with a demon, and that demon gave him immortality. So even though his head was cut off, his head just traveled across the world over to Genosha. Now, once it had arrived there, you didn't have Genosha give him a robotic body so that he'll have the ability to move around. Now, both parties came together and said, you know what? Let's get payback against the people who did us wrong. And so for Genosha, it was the X-Men. They're saying right now to the rest of the world that the X-Men had attacked them in that previous story arc, even though they had technically kidnapped the X-Men and tried to force the X-Men to be slaves in their country. And so this is Genosha saying, what we're doing right now is trying to get payback for what the X-Men have done to us. And for Cameron, he is down with the idea of hurting the mutant race, especially the X-Men, X-Factor, and New 
New Mutants because Cameron had a group known as The Right. And when it came to The Right, their main goal was to get rid of the mutant race. And so for Cameron, this goes right up his alley. One, to get rid of the X-Men, X-Factor, and New Mutants, but then after that, begin the process of going after other mutants around the world. Now, the first chapter that we are going to talk about is going to be Uncanny X-Men number 272. Now, in the opening pages of this chapter, we see our heroes right now being put on trial for crimes that they had supposedly committed against Genosha. Now, here's the thing. Most of our heroes who are here right now being put on trial were not there in the original story arc where you had the X-Men arrived in Genosha to save their own. Most of them are right now being put on trial because in the earlier parts of this crossover, they had attacked Genosha to get their friends back. Either way, they're all being put on trial for the crimes that they had committed. Now, Here's the thing, our heroes right now are powerless as well, thanks to another mutant known as Wipeout, who, well, has the ability to wipe out your powers. Now, when it comes to our heroes, they get very upset when they see Storm walk into the room, because by this point, Storm and another character known as Wolfbane, they have been turned into slaves. And so for Storm, she was assigned to protect the judge while the trial goes on. Now, when it comes to the judge and also Genosha, they're giving our heroes a choice. Two choices. One, become slaves and actually work for the government or work for our country, or two, be killed off. Like, those are your two choices. If I was you guys, I would choose the option of being slaves because at least you'll be alive. Now, when it comes to our heroes, we already know they are not going to choose the idea of becoming slaves for these evil people. Now, for Logan, he does get very upset when he sees Storm as a slave because in the earlier parts of the extension agenda, well, he came here with Psylocke hoping to save her and Wolfbane. But the problem was he failed. And so because he failed, he hates the idea of seeing her as a slave and he tries to attack the judge. Now, without his healing factor, Unfortunately, he can't do much when it comes to fighting against the magistrate to get to the judge. And so he is quickly taken down by a few guards and also Storm as well. But you have the judge say, you know what, to make sure there's not going to be another outburst, hand these guys over to Karen Hodge because they all decided to be killed off because they said, no, we will not become slaves for you people. Now, by the time our heroes arrive over to Cameron Hodge, you didn't have Cable and Gambit try their best to take down Cameron, but to also free their fellow friends. But here's the problem. One, Gambit and Cable are powerless. But two, when it comes to Cameron and his new robotic body, it has so many different kinds of abilities that Cable and Gambit are unable to overcome all those different kinds of abilities. Like for example, he is able to phase through solid objects. He has a healing factor and the list goes on. And so for Cable and Gambit, they are once again recaptured and brought back with the rest of the group. Now, when it comes to Cameron, like I said earlier, when it comes to our heroes, they had decided to go ahead and die rather than be slaves for Genosha. But that's the problem though. For Cameron, he's now looking at our heroes as toys to play with. And so yes, they're going to die, but he is going to take his time. Now, before he's able to start, we have to remember that Havoc is also working for Genosha, but for a completely different reason. You see, when it came to the X-Men in an earlier story arc, they had to walk through something called the Siege Perilous, which had the ability to give the X-Men new lives across the world. Now, sometimes that new life can be great, and sometimes it could be horrible, but also sometimes you may remember everything from your past life or you may forget everything from your past life. And so when it came to Havoc, when he walked through the Siege Perilous, 
He arrived here in Genosha, but not remembering anything from his past life. Now, by this point in our crossover, he does remember everything. But right now, he is pretending that he has no idea that he was an X-Men, that he is the brother to Cyclops, because right now, he is waiting for the right time to free his fellow teammates. Now, when it comes to Psylocke, she says, you know what? I changed my mind. I hate the idea of being tortured. I hate the idea of seeing my friends being tortured. I'd rather be a slave than be killed off. And so you have Cameron tell Havoc, okay, fine, take her over to David to have him change her into a slave because she agreed to become one and they leave. Now, after you have Havoc and Psylocke leave the room, you have Cameron say, you know what? It's now time for me to continue to play with my toys. And so he turns back over and grabs Archangel and Wolverine because this man knows that these two characters do not like each other at all. And the reason why? because of Jean Grey. You see, we already knew that Cyclops and Jean Grey were together. We already knew that Logan also liked Jean Grey, but so did Archangel since the 1960s. And really, anytime Jean Grey is single, that man tries his best to get with her, but always failed. And so in the 70s, when he found out that Logan had a crush on Jean Grey, oh man, the hatred was on. Really, also because when it came to Logan, he was very rude towards Archangel as well. But either way, you have Cameron being able to have the two characters fight against each other. Now, when it comes to Archangel, we have to remember that by this point, his wings they have a mind of their own, actually. And so, when it comes to Archangel, because right now he's technically powerless, he no longer has control of his wings. And so, his wings begin to attack Wolverine. And for Logan, he has to protect himself. And so, yes, you do have the two characters fighting against one another. Now, by this point in our coverage, we have to remember that Richter and Jubilee and also Boom Boom are no longer prisoners of Genosha. Really, Jubilee never was. And when it came to Richter and Boom Boom, they were able to escape earlier. And really, when it came to the rest of the heroes being captured, they realized they had no choice but to go ahead and back away. Because again, if they had stayed, they would also be prisoners as well. Now, when it comes to our younger heroes, they see David Moreau breaking into a different part of the Citadel. Now, remember, when it comes to David, he was the guy who had created the process that turned mutants into slaves. When someone turned 13 years old in Genosha, there's a test given to you to prove if you are a mutant or not. If that test proves that you are one, you become a slave. And so for our young heroes, they know that he is one of the main bad guys of this country. But where in the world is he going to right now when it comes to breaking into a different part of the Citadel? Now, when it comes to Cameron Hodge, He's getting very bored about the idea of watching Wolverine and Archangel go against each other. And so now he's going after a different character, which is going to be Wipeout. But while he's doing that, you have Psylocke on her way over to become a slave. Except we kind of find out that she had lied about the idea of wanting to become one. Because now she's able to begin the process of a breakout to free herself but also the rest of her team now luckily for her havoc is technically back on their side and so he is able to help her out now when it comes to cameron he does arrive into the office of david moreau hoping to find david but david is not there we already know where he's at he's trying to break into a different part of the citadel and so for cameron he says fine if david's not around i'll just go ahead and hack into his computer now when it comes to cameron he's able to find out that david david has a plot to bring down Cameron Hodge. Now we 
have to remember that in this entire crossover, it was well established that these two guys do not like each other at all, especially David. He hated Cameron and everything he standed for. Now, when it comes to Wipeout, he walks into the room. And so you have Cameron turn around and he kill off Wipeout for a completely different reason. Now, we jump back over to our heroes who are still prisoners. Now, when it comes to Cyclops, he realized that one of the abilities that Cameron Hodge has is to be able to throw these spikes out of his body. And one of those spikes hit Gambit. And so you have Gambit being able to use the spikes as a way to be a lockpick to break open the locks. And so now our heroes are free again. Now for Cyclops, he does tell everyone that he realized that Psylocke has a plan. But the question is, what is that plan? Now, when it comes to Havoc, when he arrives into the office of David Moreau, he finds Wipeout. And this is the reason why Cameron Hodge had killed off Wipeout, to make it seem like Havoc was the killer. Because Wolfbane appears, and she says, guys, listen, it was him, it was Havoc. He's the one who had killed off Wipeout because Havoc still pretends that he's part of their group, part of their organization. And so the other guards in the building are like, oh, well, she says she saw you with the dead body and kind of seems like you did use your abilities to kill him off. The way his body is right now, he does seem a tad bit roasted. So Havoc, we kind of do believe that you are the killer. Now, there is a character I do want to talk about, and that would be Tam Anderson. Now, when it comes to Tam, she's actually the sheriff of the entire magistrate organization. And so because of that, she's in charge of a lot of different soldiers. But when it comes to Tam, she is no longer trying to help Genosha out. She is no longer trying to help out the president, nor trying to help out Cameron Hodge. This is her right now really committing treason and trying to bring him down and anybody else who's on his side because she realized that that man, Cameron, is completely insane. And so we see her trying to transport Storm somewhere else. But unfortunately, she is caught by Cameron, who now knows that she is trying to commit treason. Now, luckily for Tam, you have Psylocke appear. And Psylocke is able to grab Storm and also Tam to get the heck out of there. But getting back over to our heroes who are still prisoners, we see them right now trying to break out of their binds. But then you have Tam and Storm walk into the room. Now, when they do, at first, it's our heroes believing that Tam is a bad guy still, that Tam is working with Cameron Hodge. But then you have Tam tell Storm, bring Cyclops over to you. Now, at first, our heroes still believe that Storm is just being a slave following orders but in reality she's not because storm is no longer under anybody's control you see when it came to david this man had a plan in motion to bring down cameron hodge and he knew that storm had to be part of that plan and so you have storm reveal that technically she's no longer under anyone's control at all but also she has the ability to restore other people's powers and so you have storm give cyclops a light shock and just like that this man had just regained his optic beam and luckily just in time because karen hodge just barged right into the room and cyclops releases a huge blast hoping to do some damage on cameron now the next chapter we have to talk about is New Mutants number 97. Now in the opening pages of this chapter, we actually see Cyclops trying his best to use his optic beam to bring down Cameron Hodge. But here's the problem. Cameron Hodge's new robotic body is just too strong to bring down so easily. And so he is able to actually eat the blast that Cyclops is constantly throwing at him like it's nothing. Now, when it comes to Cyclops, he's trying to do this to give Storm enough time to reactivate the other hero's power so that they can all work together to bring down Cameron Hodge. But the problem is, Cameron is 
not giving them enough time to actually pull it off. But luckily for our heroes, a bomb goes off. Now, when it comes to Cyclops, in our last video, we had talked about the idea that him and Forge had a plan going on that only they knew about. The rest of the team had no idea about this plan. And that plan was a secret bomb. And you see, when it came to Forge, he was knocked out in our last video because he knew that if he got captured, when it comes to Genosha, they would try to read his mind. And if they did, they would find the bomb. And so he basically made sure that he was unconscious to make sure they couldn't read his mind. And so now that bomb has gone off. And that bomb did enough damage to bring down part of the building onto Cameron Hodge. Now he is not dead, but it does give our heroes enough time to kind of get away and to regroup. Now I want to jump back over to Richter, Boom Boom, and Jubilee because remember, they were following David. They were not with the rest of our heroes, but they realized that David was trying to dig a hole into the Citadel and we kind of find out that he was trying to find the secret lair that belonged to Cameron Hodge. But here's the problem though. You see, when it came to David, he used one of his mutant slaves to help dig into the lair, except when they got into the lair, Forge Bomb went off. And so part of the explosion killed off the mutant, but knocked out David. Now, when it comes to our heroes, they grabbed David and went into the lair. And they realized it belonged to Cameron Hodge. Now, the only reason why they knew it belonged to Cameron is because he walked into the room. And he realized that when it came to Forge Bomb, they were trying to bring down the computer that's connected to Cameron's mind. But luckily for Cameron, the computer was not completely destroyed and he leaves his lair. Now, when it comes to Richter, he wakes up David and says, You're, you are going to take me over to Wipeout to give you the chance to get my abilities back because it's time for me to bring down the entire building. Now, getting back over to our heroes who were prisoners, you do have them go over to Forge. And you have Cyclops being able to say a phrase to actually wake him up. Now, once you have Forge get back up and realize that Storm is okay, you have those two characters make out. Now, when it comes to Cyclops, they got a lot of work to do. First, they got to find Rain Sinclair, Wolfbane, the other mutant that was turned into a slave. But also, they got to find Cameron Hodge and bring him down. And so our heroes are once again going to split up. Now, when it comes to Wolverine, he does have one concern, and that is Havoc, because none of them know that Havoc is actually good again. They still believe that he is a bad guy. But you have Cyclops say, hey, if you see him, just work with him. Try to help him to realize that he is a good person. And again, they have no idea that he already knows about his past life. Now, I want to jump over to Richter, Boom Boom, and Jubilee because they're with David. And really, they were able to find Wolfbane. But the problem is, Wolfbane was listening to her last command by Cameron Hodge. And so, she goes out of her way to attack Richter. Now, let's not forget that Richter and Rain Sinclair, they were actually in love with one another. And so, to see her like this, he freaks out. Now, luckily for Richter, David was there to give her a command to stop, but they realized that she is in full on slave mode now to Genosha and David. Now, when it comes to Richter, he's very upset. And the reason why? Well, yes, Wolfbane, but also because our heroes find the dead body of Wipeout. And like I said earlier, when it comes to Wipeout, he has the ability to wipe away your powers, but he also has the ability to give your powers back. But with them being dead, our young heroes believe that they no longer have the chance to get their powers back. But luckily for them, Cyclops, not Cyclops, sorry, Cable and Storm arrive. And you have Storm begin the process to return their abilities. Now, when it comes to Storm, she does have the ability to give Richter and Boom Boom their abilities back. But when it comes to Wolfbane, there is a small 
problem. Let me explain. So when it comes to the process to turning someone into a slave for Genosha, like I said, you are getting brainwashed to the point where the only thing you believe is that you have to serve the people of Genosha and use your abilities to help their country out. That is it. And the problem is there's no way to reverse that. And so when it comes to Wolfbane, it does seem like she will always be a slave. But here's the catch. When she's in her regular wolf form, she actually has the ability to think for herself and not be a slave. But that's the problem, though. She has to stay in her wolf form form if she tries to turn back into a regular human unfortunately she cannot think for herself she'll have the mind of a slave in genosha now when it comes to wolfbane she is down with the idea of getting revenge against karen hodge for what he has done to her and her friends now, when it comes to one of the teens that Cyclops have put together, while they were just walking around, they had no idea that they were being watched by Cameron Hodge. Now, when it comes to this team, you have Iceman, Psylocke, Beast, Gambit, Banshee, and Forge. Now, you have a pretty decent team here, and you would think, okay, they should be able to bring down Cameron Hodge. No. That is completely wrong. As soon as this guy fades into the room they're on, he takes them out left and right. It gets to the point where it really comes down to Forge and also Beast to try their best to bring him down. Now, luckily for this team, you have Cameron Hodge leave them alone. And the reason why, because back in his secret lair, Cable's team is getting rid of a computer that is heavily connected to Cameron Hodge. And he needs that computer really bad. And so while taking down Beast's team, he realized that his computer is being damaged. And so he leaves them alone to go deal with Cable's team. Now, when he does arrive, Cable's team is also struggling to bring down Cameron Hodge. But luckily for our heroes, when it comes to David, he does have a weapon that does some serious damage to Cameron's body. But here's the problem though. Cameron kills off David just like that, and then he disappears. Now for our heroes, they are very upset about the idea that they weren't able to bring down Cameron Hodge. Now something else I should also mention is that earlier in this story arc, they found the what could be ashes of Warlock, what's left of him. Because remember, he died in the earlier parts of this crossover so when they find his ashes in some kind of container they said listen we have to take this back and spread these ashes on the grave of doug ramsey aka cypher because cypher and warlock were like best friends but you have most of cable's team continue on to hopefully find cameron hodge and to bring him down now, when it comes to the final chapter, it does take place in X-Factor number 62. Now, most of the pages early on in this chapter is really more just Cable's team trying to fight against Cameron Hodge once again. But that's the problem though. Cameron Hodge is just way too strong for our heroes. Now, when it comes to Wolfbane, she does not care at all. Her main goal right now is to just get revenge, even if she has no game plan on how to bring down Cameron Hodge, she does not care because she now has a chance to actually kill off the man who did so much harm to her, but the people she loves as well. Now, when it comes to Cable, he knows that his team is losing. So he says, hey, I need to call in back up right now. And so they call in for Cyclops. Now, I want to jump over to Cyclops because you do have Cyclops telling Archangel to hurry up and go help out Cable's team. But you also have Cyclops telling Jean Grey that he wants her to stay back, like as a way to protect her. Now, he does tell her, hey, listen, I feel like your powers cannot really help us when it comes to battling against Cameron Hodge, but at the same time, I'm trying to protect you. Now, when it comes to Logan, he does get very upset in the fact that it seems like Cyclops is trying to boss her around. And so you have the two characters kind of go back and forth until you have Jean Grey step in and say, listen, Cyclops, 
I can do what I want to do. And Logan, I don't need you to speak up for me. And then you have both guys just standing there like, man, what a great woman. And then they go on to go help out to battle against Cameron Hodge. Now, I want to say that I'm going to skip over a few pages when it comes to the final chapter of this event. Because, yes, there is a lot of battles happening in this final chapter. And, yes, they're all so great. But I really want to go ahead and focus on the ending of this chapter. The ending of this event so that we can go ahead and wrap it up. Uh, so, we do pick up with Cyclops and Havoc being the last two men standing while the rest of the heroes are able to get out of the building. Now, when it comes to Cyclops and Havoc, they let Karen Hodge have everything. They release all the energy they have inside their body for one big heck of an attack on Karen Hodge. And really, it's not just one attack. They keep doing it over and over and over again, just breaking away his body piece by piece. But the problem is he does have a healing factor. And on top of that, we cannot forget that he did make a deal with a demon. And so because of that deal, this man truly cannot die. Now you do have Cameron, uh, Cyclops, and also Havoc fall off the top of the building, but Cyclops and Havoc are caught by Jean Grey. Now, when it comes to Cameron, even though he's just ahead, he's still alive because the deal he made with that demon. And he truly believes that his new body can reheal itself back to what it was in the earlier parts of this event. And so even though he's just ahead, he believes that he should be able to just bounce right back until you have Wolfbane being able to tell Richter, bring down the entire building because remember when it comes to Richter he has the ability to create seismic waves and so by doing that he was able to bring down the entire citadel right on top of Cameron Hodge now we already know that he's not dead but it will take him a very long time to come back and be a problem for our heroes again down the road now the last two pages of this book, it really does wrap everything up for us. Now yes, you do have our heroes go their separate ways, but when it comes to um, Anderson, the person in charge of the magistrate, she does tell the other countries around the world that the military has now officially taken over the island that the government has been overthrown and so right now they are in charge and their main goal is to make this country a better place not just for humans but also mutants as well now when it comes to wolfbane she does not leave with the new mutants she stays here to help out to begin the process of trying to fix this place back up now for richter he is heartbroken because now the woman he loves is not going to go back with him home. And so he is sad, but she does ascertain to do one last thing before they leave. She says, can you please spread the ashes of Warlock on top of Doug's grave? Because Cypher, who died back in fall of the mutants, they were close friends. And I think Doug will love the idea of Warlock ashes being on top of his grave. And really, you have the new mutants do that. Now, I kind of want to sit down and quickly explain what was Karen Hodge's master plan when it came to Genosha. You see, what he was going to do was take over the entire island and turn it into some kind of mega base that would then allow him to hunt down other mutants around the world. Because again, when it came to Cameron Hodge, his whole idea was to get rid of the mutant race. And so he wanted to take over Genosha and turn it into a military island technically to go out there to find other mutants and kill them or possibly turn them into slaves. But this is
What's going on there, YouTube? Welcome back to another comic book video. Okay, so we're going to continue our coverage over X-Men comics. But now it's time for us to jump back over to New Mutants. And we're going to cover the final three issues of this series. Issues number 98, 99, and 100. And we also get the first appearance of a lot of different characters. But the most popular one is Deadpool. Now, when it comes to this three-part story arc, this is where we see the end of the New Mutants, but the birth of X-Force. It all started right here. And so the first chapter that we are going to talk about is going to be New Mutants number 98. Now, the opening pages of this book alone, we are introduced to one of the many characters who is going to be somewhat important in X-Force comics, and his name is Gideon. Now, when it comes to the opening pages of this book, we don't learn much about Gideon. All we know that this man is a businessman, and this man got plans for so many different things happening across X-Men comics. Now, when it comes to Gideon, we see him doing his morning exercise by fighting against some robots that were created by Sebastian Shaw. Now, once he's able to take down all those robots, he's then confronted by his assistant, better known as Adam. Now, when it comes to Adam, he does inform Gideon that they're about to handle a certain kind of problem when it comes to another company. Now, this company belongs to Emmanuel da Costa. Now, Emmanuel is the father to Sunspot, and apparently, when it comes to Gideon, he has plans for that company. And so you do have Gideon ask Adam, how are you going to take care of Emmanuel, the father to Sunspot? And he says, don't worry, we sent our best lady, and that would be Eve. But now we have to jump over to the base of the New Mutants. Now, around this time in Marvel Comics, when it came to the New Mutants, they were using the sub-basement to Charles Xavier School because, well, around this time in Marvel Comics, the school was not around at all. And when it came to X-Factor and the X-Men, they were not there either around this story arc. And so it allowed the New Mutants to be able to use the base for their own. And and so we do see Cable and also Cannonball in the danger room. Now, this is Cable trying to teach Cannonball how to use his ability in a different kind of way that could possibly help them out in the field. And so, yes, we are still continuing the idea of Cable being this teacher, but really now we're going to see Cable become this leader because he believes that there's going to be wars across the world that him and his team have to be a part of. Now, let's not forget that when it came to Gideon, he did say that he was going to handle the whole Emmanuel da Costa problem. The idea of trying to deal with that company that most likely he wants to take over. And so we do see his special lady Eve right now pretending to be an assistant for Emmanuel. And she does hand him his morning coffee. Except when Emmanuel drinks the coffee, well, he begins to have a heart attack and he dies right there. And so this is going to begin the process of Sunspot leaving the team. And you see what I mean as we go through the rest of today's video. Now, I want to jump over to Richter and Boom Boom because this begins the process of us seeing Richter leaving the team. So let me explain. When it comes to Richter, he hates the idea that the team left behind his girlfriend in Genosha. You see, there was a crossover known as the Extension Agenda between the X-Men, X-Factor, and the New Mutants as they all came together to go up against the forces of Genosha a country that would take mutants and turn them into slaves to help build up their economy. Now, when it came to our heroes, they were able to win in that big battle, but Wolfbane, she stayed behind to help begin the process to turn that place around into a better place for both humans 
and mutants, especially mutants. Now for Richter, he believes that there must be some kind of trick behind it because when it came to Wolfbane, she was one of the mutants that was turned into a slave. And usually when you are turned into a slave in Genosha, you are completely brainwashed. You no longer have the ability to think for yourself, the ability of free will. Now here's the thing, she lost those abilities while she was in her human form. But when she was in her werewolf form or her wolf form, she regained those abilities. But for Richter, he still believes that there must be some kind of trick behind it because there's no way that Wolfbane, the woman he loves so much, will decide to stay behind to help out that country and not stay with him. And so he wants to leave to go back over there to hopefully bring her back over to America. But now it's time for us to get into the first appearance of Deadpool. You see, while you have Cable just minding his business, well, out of nowhere, he is attacked from behind by Deadpool. Now, for Deadpool, he does inform us that he was hired by a guy known as Mr. Tolliver, another character who is going to be very important in X-Force comics, had hired Deadpool to find Cable and to kill Cable. And so right now, this is Deadpool just trying to complete the contract. Now, when it comes to Deadpool, this man is prepared for Cable and really for the rest of the team as well because once he's able to take down Cable, you do have the rest of the team arrive. But one by one, they all get taken out by Deadpool. And it really does look like we're going to see Cable most likely be killed off by Deadpool. But at the very last second, the entire team, including Cable, is saved by Domino. This is her first appearance in X-Men comics. And when she appeared, she was able to take down Deadpool from behind. Now, you do have the team being able to see how Domino really affects Cable. What I mean is, once you have Cable and Domino both agree that to send Deadpool back to this Mr. Tolliver character, you did have Cable smile. Now, him smiling, it really shows that he's kind of happy to see Domino around again. And for the rest of the team, they kind of believe that there could be something more going on between Cable and also Domino. Now later on that night you do have Cable and Domino sit down with one another and this is them kind of wondering who else can they bring in to kind of build up this team to get ready for the war that Cable is talking about. But here's the problem right now. They keep looking at different characters who have left over the years when it comes to the new mutant team. So for example, like Fire Fist, or like Danny Moonstar, Karma, Skid, different characters who have moved on in different directions. And so for Cable and also Domino, all those different characters can no longer be used when it comes to him putting together the team that he wants to have for his war. And so right now, all he has is Richter, Boom Boom, Domino, Sunspot, and Cannonball. And really, we can't even say that Richter is going to be on the team because by the next page, we see Richter leaving the base of the new mutants. And we see that he left a note behind for Boom Boom to inform her that he is going to leave to go back to Genosha to get Wolfbane and to hopefully bring her back over to America because he cannot live without her. But the last page for issue number 98, we see Sunspot being confronted by Gideon. And when it comes to Gideon, he does inform Sunspot like, hey man, listen, I got some bad news for you. Your father is dead. He had a heart attack. But now we have to jump into New Mutants number 99. Now, with the opening pages of this book, we are being introduced to another new character who is going to be important in X-Force comics, and her name is Pharaoh. Now, for Pharaoh, we're going to learn more about her actual origin in later books down the road, but for the sake of this video, just know that she is going to be on the X-Force team. Now, as you can tell, she does look somewhat similar to Wolfbane and because, well, she's going to be used to replace Wolfbane on the team. Now, 
for Pharaoh, we see her on the run at the moment. And we see that she's being chased down by a character known as Mask. Now, when it comes to Mask, he is the leader of the Morlocks. Now, the Morlocks are a group of mutants that live in the sewers or the tunnels of New York. And the reason why? Because when they had gained their mutant abilities, well, their appearance was deformed to the point where they could no longer hide in public. And so they hide in the tunnels. Now, after the mutant massacre happened, where you have most of the Morlocks be killed off, you have Mass take over the entire group. But this man got plans on plans when it comes to him leading the Morlocks. And right now, he's trying to force Pharaoh to join the Morlocks, but she does not want to. And she is able to get away, but just barely. But now we pick up with Cable trying to recruit another person for his team. Now, the person he's trying to recruit is a character known as James Proudstar. Now, when it comes to James, he is the younger brother to another character known as Thunderbird. Now, Thunderbird had died back in like Uncanny X-Men number 95, soon after you had the second X-Men team come together after the first team had left to go their separate ways. And matter of fact, Thunderbird was an X-Men, but like I said, he died soon after he had joined the X-Men when the second team came around. Now for his younger brother, James here, he was actually recruited by Emma Frost to join her school and become part of the Hellions. Now the Hellions were kind of like her own version of the New Mutants. And he stayed there for a while, but now he had had left her school to go back home and so he's kind of happy for the first time since his brother's death but this is Cable saying I need you to join my team and so now we know that this is going to be another character who is going to be really important in X-Force comics. But now we have to jump back over to Gideon. Now, as we saw, Gideon is trying to do something when it comes to Sunspot's father's company. And so we saw that he had killed off Emmanuel in the last chapter. But now we see Gideon talking to Sunspot in a way about, hey, you know what? you should take over the actual company that your dad left behind. Now, like I said, we already know that Gideon has plans down the road for this company, but it's also a way to remove Sunspot from this team, to get rid of this character, to bring in some more new blood for the new team coming in X-Force comics. Now, for Sunspot, he was an original new mutant. He's been around since the very beginning, but now... It's him saying goodbye so that he is able to take over his father's company. And really, we don't stop there because once we jump back over to the rest of the team, you have Boom Boom being able to inform everyone that Richter had left, that Richter had disappeared to go back and go get Wolfbane from Genosha. Now, let's not forget, when it comes to Richter, he has some bad blood with Cable, but unfortunately, we don't get answers to that plot line until much later. And so Richter is now off the team. Now for Cannonball, he's kind of upset about the idea that every single person that he was close to is mostly gone except for Boom Boom and Sunspot. And really, when it comes to Sunspot, he has not told them that he is also leaving as well. Now when it comes to Cable, he's all like, well, he's gone. That sucks. Let's move on. But for Cannonball, he's kind of like, how dare you, Cable? Like, we're losing team members left and right. How are you not upset that Richter is gone? But for Cable, he's all like, dude, this is a war. We're going to lose soldiers left and right. Unfortunately, you have to understand how to handle the idea of losing someone. Just be happy that he was not killed off, that he just walked away. There's still a possibility that you may see him again down the road. But for Cannonball, he cannot accept an answer like that from Cable. Now, to kind of push the idea of James being able to join Cable's team, when he does go back home to see his people, well, unfortunately, the entire area was just wiped out. The whole entire reservation has been wiped out, and he finds a mask that was left behind. And that mask does belong to one 
certain group and that would be the Hellfire Club. And so now James believes the Hellfire Club was coming after him to look for him, but unfortunately they couldn't find him. And so they wiped out his entire family and everyone else who lived in that area. But you didn't have Sunspot being able to inform Cable that he is also leaving the team. But for Cable, he does not care. And the reason why? Because for him, they're soldiers. People are going to leave. They're going to come and go. And so when you have Sunspot tell him like, hey, my father died and I have to take care of the company. At first, it's just Cable saying, oh, so you're going to be gone for like what? A couple weeks, a month or two. You know what? Take all the time you need. But then you have Sunspot say, actually, man, I'm leaving for good. Like, I'm taking over my father's business. I'm off the team. And so for Cable, it's like, whatever. And he moves on with his day. Now, because what he said is Sunspot, it takes off Cannonball. And so we're kind of teased with this idea of Cannonball possibly leaving the team as well. But now we're also teased with this idea that Boom Boom might leave as well because when we jump over to her, we see her having a conversation with Domino. And really, when it comes to Boom Boom, she tells Domino like, hey, I don't trust you. I don't trust Cable because it does seem like you two guys got schemes on schemes for so many different things. But the problem is you're not telling me nor Cannonball what those schemes are. And really by this point, Cannonball and Boom Boom are the last two members of the New Mutants. Everyone else is gone. Now for Domino, she says, listen, you are no longer a child. And so there's no point of us trying to shelter you. There's no point of us trying to treat you like you are children. It's time for you guys to grow up and get ready to face the real world. Now for Boom Boom, it's kind of like, wait a second, what do you mean? And it's Domino saying, when it comes to Cable and I, you can trust us. You can definitely trust cable but the thing is the cable he's trying to fight a war on so many different fronts right now and his main goal is to take out his enemies but he can show you a better version of yourself if you trust in him but if you can't then go ahead and leave because you know what nobody is stopping you but getting back over to the conversation between Cable and Cannonball, really you have Cannonball expressing the idea that when it comes to the new mutants, they were a team, yes, but they were a family. And that's the big problem he has right now with Cable. Because right now when it comes to Cable, he looks at the new mutants as soldiers he can use for his war against the different enemies out there who are coming after him and the rest of the mutant race. And so because of that, it's Cannonball saying, I understand that you have gone through so much pain and loss, but I was also hoping that my team, the new mutants who are like a family, could show you what it's like to have people around you who actually cared for one another to hopefully ease the pain that you're holding in right now. And you have Cannonball walk away. But later on that day, we do see Sunspot officially leaving the team, moving on to take care of his father's company. Now, with him being gone, that leaves Cable cannonball domino and boom boom but by the next page we see that james prowlstar is going to join the team now he does inform cable like hey somebody had wiped out my entire village and i found a mask and that mask belongs to the hellfire club and so it's cable saying if you join my team we'll help you get revenge against the hellfire club now, at the base of the New Mutants, soon to be X-Force, they don't know that they have two characters who just arrived at their base and who is going to be part of their team going forward. One of them is Feral. And when it comes to Feral, as she watches over the New Mutants talk to one another, to her, they're kind of like a family. Now, the other character is going to be Shatterstar, and he just crash land in the middle of their base just randomly out of thin air and the question is right now where did he come from 
But now we jump into New Mutants number 100. Now, as we dive into the opening pages for this book, we do pick up with our heroes realizing that they do have someone who has broken in the danger room and that would be Shatterstar. And so when you have our heroes being able to get into the danger room, they find him. And of course, they fight against him. Really, he attacks them, but either way, they have to defend themselves. Now, we don't learn much about Shatterstar here, but we are told that he's apparently believing that our heroes are working for Mojo a major character from the Mojoverse. Now, when it comes to our heroes, they're trying their best to convince Shatterstar that they don't work for Mojo at all, but he is not listening. And so you do have our heroes, really Cable, being able to just knock him out. Now, there are a few things that do happen after you have our heroes being able to take down Shatterstar. You see, you have Pharaoh nearby, and she had watched the entire battle. And so for Pharaoh, she still kind of believes that this team is kind of like a family, and she will love the idea to be adopted by this family. But after she leaves, we see that a bunch of random soldiers had appeared in the danger room. Now, these soldiers, they come from the Mojovers, and they're here for Shatterstar. And so right now, their main goal is to hunt him down. But after they leave the room, we then see that Mask and some of his Morlocks have entered the building as well. And of course, for Mask, he's only here looking for Feral. So now we have all these different parties in this one sub-basement for our new soon-to-be X-Force team. Now, we do learn a tad bit about the origin of Shatterstar, but not the complete origin. Just enough to know a tad bit about the character. You see, when it comes to Shatterstar, he is from a different reality, better known as the Mojoverse. Now, in the Mojoverse, it's being ruled by a character known as, well, Mojo. But here's the catch. You see, when it comes to Shatterstar, he is from the future of that reality, 100 years into the future. Now, he was sent back in time, but over into this reality to find some help, and that would be the X-Men. And here is the reason why. Well, really two reasons. The first is that when it comes to Shatterstar, he's part of an alliance, better known as the Cadre Alliance, and they need the help of the X-Men to bring down Mojo. And the reason why, because in 100 years prior, they had sent somebody else in time to get some help and that was Longshot. Now let's not forget that Longshot was a member of the X-Men for a good while but apparently they had sent Longshot over into this reality to find the X-Men to help out to bring down Mojo and so now their goal is to use Shatterstar to find the X-Men to bring down Mojo but the problem is the X-Men are not around because currently they're in space with Charles Xavier, and so that leaves X-Force. Now, at first, for Cable, he's kind of having a hard time believing this, but at the same time, he really wants to because then he can use Shatterstar for his new team. Now, you do have Cannonball, Boom Boom, and Cable go into the kitchen of their base, except when they arrive in the kitchen, well, they find... Feral, just trying to make some food for herself. Now, for our heroes, they're kind of wondering, who in the world is this woman right now in their kitchen trying to eat their food? But after you have our heroes being able to take her down, she does beg for their help, saying, listen, you have to help me. I'm being chased after a mask in the Morlocks, and they're trying to kill me. But for Domino, Shatterstar, and also James, they're still in the other room. But then they're confronted by no other than the Imperial Protector Rates. Now, the Imperial Protector Rates, they work for Mojo, and they are here to bring Shatterstar back into their reality. And so you have Domino and James try their best to protect him. Now you do have the rest of the team arrive and you do have all our heroes coming together for the first time to be able to bring down these few guys who came from the Mojo verse. But after being able to do that, they're then confronted by another problem. 
And really for me, this is the best moment of the book. So let me explain. So you didn't have Cable and the rest of X-Force being confronted by Mask and the two Morlocks that he brought with him. And he demands Cable to hand over Pharaoh. Now when it comes to Cable, he tells Mask, no. I am not going to do that at all. Oh, by the way, get the heck out of my home. Now for Mask, he tries his best to act all tough and walk up on Cable. But you have Cable pull a gun now and shoot one of the Morlocks that came with them, killing off that Morlock to tell Mask, you better leave or I'm going to shoot you next. If I shoot you, you're going to die like your friend right there did. And so you have Mask leave and Pharaoh is able to stay. Now, once you have everyone calm down, you have Cable call everyone back together to basically say, hey, we are going to be a new team called X-Force and we are going to work together to go after the different people who are coming after us. We have so many different enemies that we're at war with so many different people that we have no choice but to come together to take them down. We got to help out Feral to bring down Mask in the Morlocks. We got to help Shatterstar to bring down Mojo. We got to help James here to get revenge against the Hellfire Club. And the list goes on. And so for Cable, this is why he says, we are about to go to war because we have a lot of enemies and unfortunately we got to bring them down legally or illegally either way we're going to war and so now we have our x-force team now the ending of this book does leave us on one heck of a cliffhanger because we have to remember that in the earlier parts of where cable had first appeared in new mutant comics we were introduced to another team of characters out there, better known as the Mutant Liberation Front. And their goal is to attack different government agencies around the world who are working against the mutant race. Now, their leader is a character known as Strife. But by this point in Marvel Comics, we don't know much about Strife. And here is the crazy thing, because once he does go into his office, he does take off his helmet. And when he does, we see Cable. And we're kind of left to believe that Cable is Strife, or possibly Strife is a clone of Cable. Now, we already know the whole idea of who Strife is, but for the sake of this video, let's pretend like we have no idea what exactly is going on. But this is where we are. What's going on there, YouTube? Welcome back to another comic book video. Okay, so we are going to continue our coverage over the X-Men. But now it's time for us to dive into another X-Men crossover, better known as Kings of Pain. Now, Kings of Pain took place in some of the X titles annuals around this time in Marvel Comics, plus a New Warriors annual as well. Now, with that being said, this crossover is bringing back a certain character that we have not seen in a very long time. And I am talking about the idea of the early days of Chris Claremont's run on the X-Men, the real early days on his run on the X-Men. Now, with that being said, when it comes to this character coming back, they're trying to do something new and different with the character. But something else I do want to mention is that this is not the new mutant team that you all know and love because around this time in Marvel Comics, they were doing a transition from new mutants over to X-Force. And so even though the first chapter is a new mutants annual, well, they're calling themselves X-Force by this point in Marvel Comics. But they are the first team that we're going to see in this crossover. And so getting into the first chapter for today's video, we do pick up with New Mutants Annual Number 7, where we actually pick up with a team better known as the Alliance of Evil. Now, the Alliance of Evil actually used to work for Apocalypse in the early days of X-Factor comics, and we have not seen his characters for a good while now, but these characters are right now attacking a school better known as St. Simon Academy. Now, this school 
school is somewhat important because because at this school, there are two mutants known as Artie and Leech, who used to live with X-Factor in the early days of X-Factor comics. You see, when it came to X-Factor, they were going around trying to find different mutants who may need their help to learn more about their abilities or to learn how to control their abilities. And so after a while, when it came to X-Factor, they realized that even though they are able to give these kids some kind of skills with their powers, these kids still need an education. And so unfortunately, when they came to Artie and Leech, they were sent over to the school right here to get that education. Now, when it came to Artie and Leech, they met another kid known as Wizkid. And all three characters, plus the rest of the kids that x Factor has saved over the years, had formed a new team called the X-Terminators. Now, the X-Terminators was Marvel trying to have another young team of mutants out there. Unfortunately, it didn't last that long because right after you had the X-Terminators appear, they went away very quickly and most of the team went to go join the new mutants. And so when it comes to Artie, Leech, and also Wizkid, they were left behind at this school. Now, all three kids, they truly believe they have the ability to stop the Alliance of Evil. Yeah, I'm going to tell you right now, they are completely wrong. Now, there are two other characters with the Alliance of Evil who are new to Marvel Comics. One being Harness and the other one being Piecemeal. Now, when it comes to Harness, their name gives it away very quickly. They have the ability to put someone in a harness. But for Piecemeal, well, he's a tad bit different. You see, what they're doing right now, they're going to different locations to collect a certain kind of energy. And Piecemeal is being used to store that certain kind of energy inside of him. Now, Piecemeal is just a kid, but unfortunately, he's being forced to do this. And so, when you have Harness and Piecemeal arrive at the Academy, well, he goes ahead and absorb this certain kind of energy. And once they got that energy, they're like, hey, time to leave, let's go. Now, before they do leave, you have Tower, one of the members of the Alliance of Evil, knock out Wizkid, Leech, and Artie before they left. And so, they move on to the next location. Now, once you have Wizkid wake back up, He's in the medical room, but then he realized that Boom Boom and Cannonball are there because when it came to the Exterminators, they used to work alongside with the new mutants, so he knows them very well, except when he looks around the room, he realized that Cannonball and Boom Boom are not with the usual new mutants team. And he's kind of like, what in the world is going on here? Because like I said earlier, around this time in Marvel Comics, Marvel was moving away from the New Mutants and going into X-Force. And so you have Boom Boom and Cannonball say, hey, the team you knew are long gone. Meet our new team, X-Force, and meet our new team members like Pharaoh, uh, Pharaoh, sorry, Warpath, Cable, Shatterstar, and also Domino. We're X-Force. But after you have Boom Boom and Cannonball being able to introduce everyone to Wizkid, it's Cable saying, okay, cool, listen, um, kid, talk right now. We need to know what in the world is going on. You see, when it comes to X-Force, they have been trying their best to chase down the Alliance of Evil. But the problem is, every single time they arrive at what could be the next location the Alliance is going to attack at, they're a tad bit too late. When they arrived, the Alliance had already left like the Academy earlier. And so for Cable, he's kind of wondering, what is the Alliance truly after? Now for our heroes, they know a lot of information about most of the Alliance, but not the two newest members, Harness and Piecemeal. And the big question is right now, who are they? But also, what is the Alliance truly after? And so now we have to jump over to Gentech. Now, Gentech is a company, one of the two companies that is going to be really important in this crossover. So when it comes to Gentech, they were hired by a mysterious employer to create a certain kind of genetic material. The problem is, though, they got word that the Alliance of Evil is going around the world to different locations to absorb that same kind of genetic material. 
material. So the energy we saw earlier when it came to piecemeal, well, actually it was not energy. It was some kind of genetic material that was nearby the academy that he had collected. The same kind this company is also trying to create. And so right now you have the higher ups believing that, hey, what if our employer has somehow also hired the Alliance of Evil? But at the same time, they don't want to believe that. But then we pick up with another company known as IDIC. Now, IDIC is actually a company who had hired the Alliance of Evil to go around and collect that certain kind of genetic material. But they're also working on their own project as well, a containment casing to put all that material inside of it. But the question is right now, what is their end goal though? And so now we have to jump over to Niagara Falls. Now, when we do, we see the Alliance of Evil once again there, but this time they're doing crowd control to push everybody back to allow Harness and Piecemeal to be able to collect another piece of that genetic material. Except right after you have Piecemeal being able to collect that small piece of material, well, that is when you have X-Force arrive. Now, when X-Force does arrive, they are able to take down most of the Alliance with no problem at all. Now, for Harness and Piecemeal, they realize they got to dip out because their goal was to go around to different locations to collect that genetic material. They were hired to do that. That. And so you have Harness grab piecemeal and they jump off an edge. Now you believe, okay, they had just committed suicide or they killed themselves to get away from X-Force. But in reality, Harness has the ability to teleport. And so they were able to get away while the rest of the Alliance got captured by X-Force. Now you have Cable and Domino walk over the tower and say, you are going to tell us every single thing you know about your employer and what they are trying to collect. But on that same last page where we see Domino and Cable about to interrogate Tower, we go to a different location for just a few panels where we see two guys playing chess against one another. Now these two guys, they are the ones who are occurring behind everything and they're playing this game of chess with all the different characters who are so far involved in this story. Now for Cable and Domino, they were able to interrogate Tower. Now Tower does inform our heroes that the Alliance of Evil was actually hired by Gentech. Now what we saw earlier could not be true because Gentech said the Alliance of Evil are going after the same genetic material that we are going after, which means somebody else had hired them. And we saw earlier that IDIC were the ones who actually hired the Alliance of evil to collect the genetic material around the world and so tower had lied to domino and cable but the problem is our heroes don't know that and so they went over to the building of gentech and they actually broke into the compound now when they get in there they knock out all the guards but once you have our heroes get deep into the actual compound well they're confronted by the new warriors now, let's talk real briefly about the New Warriors. Okay, so the New Warriors first appear back in 1989 in Thor number 411. Matter of fact, that was part of the whole Acts of Vengeance story arc. Now, when it came to the New Warriors, they came together because of Dwayne Taylor, better known as Night Thrasher. You see, when it came to Dwayne, his parents were murdered. And so because of that, this man said, you know what, I swear for revenge against all crime and so over the years he would train to become a better fighter to become a hero and so after he reached a point where he believed that he was ready to be a hero he went out of his way to put together a team of characters who could possibly help him take down crime across the world now the reason why the new warriors are here right now is because, well, Gentech actually hired the team to protect this place. Here's the problem though. The new warriors nor X-Force are trying to talk to one another. And so now you have both teams just fighting against each other. 
Now you do have X-Force and the New Warriors actually fight against each other for a good while. And the only reason why they stop fighting against each other is because the owners of Gentech walk into the room. Now for the owners of Gentech, they say, listen X-Force, we hired the New Warriors to protect this place from the Alliance of Evil. Now for Cable, he says that's crazy because we talked to one of the members of the Alliance of Evil and they told us that actually you hired them. But he says that is not true at all. We got word that the Alliance of Evil was also trying to collect the same kind of genetic material that we are creating here in our labs. And so we realized that sooner or later the Alliance would come here and try to steal our project. That is why we hired the New Warriors to protect this place. So now Cable and the rest of X-Force, they just realized they got played by the Alliance of Evil, which means, hey, you know what? Let's go back to the prison and talk to them one more time. And maybe this time, they'll give us the right information. But now we have to check in with Harness and Piecemeal. Now, the last time we saw them was back in Niagara Falls, where they had Piecemeal collect another piece of that genetic material. But apparently, that was a while back, because... When we do jump back over to them, we see that Piecemeal must have collected a huge amount of the material because now he's bigger in weight. And so we see him begging Harness to just stop because this man cannot take any more. But for Harness, they don't care at all. They say, continue. We're now here in Alaska because there is another piece of that material that you have to collect. So go ahead and do your job. We have a job to complete here. And so once again, we see piecemeal being able to collect another piece of this genetic material. Now for X-Force and the New Warriors, they have split up into three teams. And so when it comes to the first team, they went over to the prison that the Alliance of Evil were assigned to. And so we see our heroes break out frenzy. Now at first, she truly believes that our heroes are there to break her out, to help her out. But you didn't have Cable say, no, I'm not here to break you out. I'm here to ask you more questions because you lied to me last time. And so this time, you better give me the truth or you are going to die. And so you have Frenzy tell the team like, okay, listen, the people who truly did hire us is actually AIM. Now, let's not forget that earlier, we saw a company known as IDIC be the ones who claimed that they hired uh, the Alliance of Evil. But in reality, that's a fake name, a shell company. The real people in charge of the Alliance is AIM. And so now our heroes know who they have to go after. But here's the thing though, you have Cable say, give me a location of one of their compounds. And so you have Frenzy being able to hand over that piece of information. Now, for the second team, they do arrive at the location the first team learned about from Frenzy. Now, for the second team, when they do arrive at that location, they do find that AIM was working on some kind of containment sealing device shaped in a way of a human. And so that tells us that when it comes to the Alliance of Evil, Harness, and also Piecemeal, the reason why they were collecting that genetic material was to put that material in this human-shaped containment sealing device. And the question is right now, are they trying to create a new kind of robot? And so for our heroes, they're kind of wondering what else could AIM be up to when it comes to this project. Now, the rest of our heroes, the third and final team, they went over to the sub-basement to Charles Xavier School. Now, around this time in Marvel Comics, it was the last base for the New Mutants, but they had left the place, and the rest of the school got blown up back in X-Men Inferno. Now, when it comes to our heroes, they want to use Cerebro as a way to cross-reference all the information that they have received from Gentech. Now, here is the big thing. So as we know, the Alliance of Evil, they were going around collecting different pieces of this genetic material. But here's the catch though. All those different pieces came from somewhere else before arriving at those different locations. They all came from 
Mere Island. And so now the third team has to take that info and tell the rest of the teams what they had just learned. And we do get another moment where we see Harness and we also see Piecemeal going out of their way to collect another piece of that genetic material. Really, it's more Harness saying, you are going to do what I asked you to do here, Piecemeal. So go ahead and absorb another piece of that genetic material. But here's the problem, though. Once again, we see that he has gotten bigger and bigger when it comes to weight. And so it's kind of telling us that sooner or later, he will be unable to absorb any more of that material. So once you have all three teams being able to come back together as one big team, you then have Cable realize something very important here. He wants to know, when did all these different pieces break apart from one another? And so you then have our heroes come to find out that it happened back on October 13th, 1987. Now for Cable, that is a very important date. And the reason why? Because that is the same day the X-Men had fought against Proteus, the son to Mora Mittagger. And around his time in Marvel Comics, he was kind of known as the most powerful mutant on the planet. The dude had the ability to warp reality around him. And so for Cable, he's kind of like, oh my God, they're going out of their way to collect the different pieces of Proteus to bring him back to life and to possibly use them for their own evil scheme. And this is where we are going to end today's comic book video. So please, leave me a like down below and subscribe. But guys, see y'all next time, later. What's going on there, YouTube? Welcome back to another comic book video. Okay, so we're going to continue our coverage over Kings of Pain, the next crossover that we are talking about on my channel for the X-Men. Now, when it comes to Kings of Pain, it was a crossover that was done over in the annuals for Marvel Comics around this time. Three of the annuals were X titles, and one of them being a New Warriors annual. Now, with that being said, so far, we had learned that there were two different companies working for two mysterious people to bring back a certain character and that character is no other than Proteus. Now Proteus is a very powerful character and so let me explain. So when it comes to Proteus, his real name is Kevin McTaggart. He is the son to another character known as Mora McTaggart. Now, here's the thing. There have been a lot of retcons done on this character over the years in Marvel Comics. And I'm not going to sit down and try to explain all those different kinds of retcons for the sake of this video. So all we know right now is he is the son to Mora McTaggart. Now, when it came to Kevin, when he was young, he did gain his mutant ability, but that was the beginning of the downfall. So once he did gain his mutant ability, it began to, well, burn out his body. Now, before we dive deeper into his origin, I want to say that when it comes to Kevin, he has the ability to warp reality around him, making him a very powerful mutant. But like I said, though, once he did gain his mutant ability, well, unfortunately, it began to burn out his body. And so Mormon Taggart had to lock up Kevin in a special kind of cell to keep him alive just long enough until she was able to find a way to save her son. Unfortunately, there was a battle between the X-Men and Magneto. Now, because of that battle, his cell got damaged. And so because of that, he was able to walk free again. But here comes the big problem. You see, that cell was keeping his body alive. And so when the cell got damaged, his body completely died. And so he had to find a new host. And that kind of told us that when it comes to Proteus, he's kind of like this, this source of energy floating around looking for the next host to keep him alive. And so in the original story that he appeared in, we saw him going to body to body, hoping to find the right body to keep him alive long enough so that he is able to rejoin society. But that's the problem though. His powers just 
kept burning every single body that he would find. Now the story did end with Colossus being able to kill Law Proteus because one of his weakness is metal. And so once you had Colossus being able to kill Law Proteus, we were left to believe that he was gone forever, but Kings of Pain changed that. See, we kind of find out that after Colossus had supposedly defeated Proteus, Proteus did not die. His energy body was just broken into many pieces across the world. Now, there were two companies who were trying to bring Proteus back to life. One of those companies we can totally forget about because by this point, they're no longer really important for the sake of the story. And so now we can focus on AIM one of the two companies that was trying to bring Proteus back to life. You see, when it came to AIM, they realized if you were able to go around the world to find those different pieces of Proteus and actually put him back together, but also put him inside a containment suit, then Proteus could come back to life. And that was AIM's goal. But also AIM was planning to use Proteus to control him. And if they had that power to control him, They'll be unbeatable because again, Proteus has the ability to warp reality around him, making him one of the most powerful mutants in the world. And so right now you have X-Force and new warriors freaking out. And they said, listen, if they're trying to bring back Proteus, we have to tell more Metagger. And so they went over to Mir Island. Now there is something else we do have to talk about, but luckily we can talk about that thing as we dive into the opening pages of today's story. And that would be more Metagger. Now you see, when it came to more in the earlier story arcs of our coverage on the X-Men, she has been acting different, more aggressive a lot of times, and sometimes more happy than usual. And so for our heroes on the X-Men, the main X-Men team, they begin to realize that more Metagger is not her usual self. Now, let's not forget that when it came to more Metagger around this time in Marvel Comics, she had her own X Men team that she had put together on the island as well. But here's the thing they're also not acting normal either. And the question is right now, why? Now, when it came to the earlier story arcs, we did get a few hints on who could most likely be in control of those characters. This book right here, it flat out tells us who is controlling more Metagger in her X-Men. It is the Shadow King. And here is the reason why it's so important because you have X-Force and the new warriors arrive to her island to inform her like, hey, AIM is trying to bring back your son, we need to work together, except she's not answering their calls. And so when X-Force and the new warriors get close to her island, she turns on her defense system to basically get rid of them. Now you do have our heroes try their best to get rid of those weapons, but then you have Mora walk out with her X-Men to get into a battle with our heroes. Now, that battle does last for a few pages, but after a while, you did have Cable saying, stop, or I'll shoot you. Like, stop right now, or I'll shoot you. I came here for a good reason. I came here to tell you that AIM is trying to bring back your son, Kevin. Now, like I said earlier, when it comes to AIM, they're trying to put Proteus back together. And so what they did was they hired two characters known as Harness and Piecemeal. And so Piecemeal has the ability to absorb the different pieces of Proteus into his body. And so because of Piecemeal, they're going to be able to actually bring Proteus back to life. And so we continue to see Piecemeal being used as a way to absorb all the different pieces of Proteus. Now he is being controlled by Harness. Now, we don't know much about these two characters, but these last two chapters are going to give us the ability to learn more about them, especially Harness. And here is the reason why. So while you have Piecemeal going out of his way to collect another piece of Proteus, well, you have Harness saying, you know, I own you. You're mine inside and out. And so we're kind of left to believe that they're very close to one another in some kind of way, possibly being his mother, a very evil mother. Now, getting back over to our heroes, we do see X-Force and the new warriors being able to catch more Metagger up to speed and her X-Men as well to say, hey, 
This is what happened so far in this story. And so now you know, do you want to help us to stop AIM before they are able to bring your son back to life? Now for more Metagger, she's very upset about the idea that AIM is trying to bring her son back to life and most likely use him for their own personal gain. And so yes, you have more Metagger agree to work with X-Force and the new warriors to stop AIM. And that includes her X-Men team as well. Now, while you have all three teams talking to one another, well, they get a call from WHO. Now, WHO stands for Weird Happening Organization. They go around the world to investigate weird things happening in the world. And so right now, they're calling our heroes saying, hey, listen, um, we just saw two characters, one in an armor suit and a young boy getting bigger and bigger like he's been eating too much. Um, yeah, they're over here. Can y'all go there and check it out for us, please? And so our heroes now know it's Harness and Piecemeal, and they gotta go. Now, we do get a quick page to remind us that there are two mysterious men who have been working in the shadows, and we still have no idea who they are, but when it comes to Gentech, AIM, Harness, Piecemeal, all these different characters, they're being controlled technically by these two guys. They're playing a game against each other to see who will be able to actually pull off this master scheme of bringing back Proteus. But either way, they're playing chess with all of our different characters so far. Now the rest of this chapter is really more of our heroes working together to stop Harness, but to find a way to save piecemeal as well. Now, I want to shift our focus onto Harness, and here is the reason why. So when it comes to Harness, she has the ability to use this energy rod as a whip or use it as a leech, hence the name Harness. Now the rest of her weapons, they all come from her armor suit that she wears. But anyways, you do have our heroes trying their best to bring her down, while you have other heroes trying their best to save piecemeal. Now, I'm going to skip over a few pages, and the reason why, because most of those pages are just really, you know, seeing our heroes trying to bring down Harness, but trying to save piecemeal. I want to get the good point of this chapter, where we see our heroes realize that piecemeal has absorbed too many pieces of Proteus and so it does seem like this kid this young boy might actually die here he might actually explode and technically he does but he doesn't die right there you see because he did absorb so many pieces of Proteus you have the two young boys Proteus and also piecemeal combined into one being giving birth to a new Proteus better known as Proteus 2 so yes Proteus has returned, and for our heroes, this is a huge problem, because now you are talking about the idea of one of the most powerful mutants who has the ability to warp reality returning to Marvel Comics, and right now, he is about to cause a whole lot of problems. Now, the last chapter for Kings of Pain was actually an X-Factor annual. Now, with this annual, it really does show how powerful Proteus truly is. Because, like I said earlier, this was one of the most powerful mutants around his time in X-Men comics. The man had the ability to warp reality around him. And so, with him being back, but now being combined with piecemeal, Scotland is no longer looking like, well... Scotland. Right now, Scotland is kind of like this, a series of geometrical figures all over the place, and they're being used to represent different people or buildings in Scotland. Now, for X Factor, they know that this is Proteus, and they know they have to go deeper and deeper into Scotland to hopefully find him and to hopefully bring him down. Because really, other teams out there across the world, they're kind of wondering if they should help out when it comes to something like this right here. You have Excalibur wondering if they should jump in. You have the Avengers wondering if they should jump in. You have other teams out there on standby saying, all right, X-Factor, you're saying you got this. Please show us you can. If you can't, we're going to jump in. Now, once you have X-Factor being able to find Proteus at the heart of this whole area, well, they run into a huge problem. 
which is, well, Proteus. Because, like I said, this man can warp reality around him. And so you have X Factor try to use their different abilities hoping to actually bring him down. But the problem is, though, Proteus is able to stop their attacks in so many different ways because, again, he's warping reality around them. Now, for Beast, he does learn one big lesson right here. The idea that Proteus is no longer weak to metal because you have Beast try his best to come from behind hoping to take down Proteus with some metal gauntlets and he finds out that does not work anymore. And so you have Proteus just take down the entire team and then he teleports them into his mind. Now for Aang, they're seeing what's happening right now in Scotland. But this is Aang saying, okay, our plan failed. Like our goal was to contain Proteus before he was able to come back to full power. But unfortunately, our plan failed. So now we're going to back out. Now, some of the members of AIM, they're kind of wondering, hey, what are we going to do with Harness? And they said, listen, if she survives, most likely she'll be arrested. But if she does survive and not arrested, then don't worry. We'll take care of her down the road. But for right now, we got to make sure there's no trail that leads back to us that shows that we were involved in this hot mess. Now, once you have X-Factor being able to meet up with X-Force, the New Warriors, the X-Men inside the mind of Proteus, this is where Jean Grey tells us how they're going to be able to stop Proteus. You see, for Jean Grey, she realized when her mind was connected to Proteus' mind, she learned something about him. Now, something else I want to mention is that around his time in X-Men comics, Jean Grey no longer had the ability to be a telepath. So it was really Proteus who was able to connect his mind to her. But either way, with their minds being connected to one another, she learned that Proteus was happy when he was technically quote unquote dead. Let me explain. So when he came to Proteus, when he was defeated by Colossus many years ago, his body did fall apart to all those different pieces across the world. But when his body was like that, he felt nothing. And honestly, that was when he was the happiest because let's not forget before that he was locked away in a cell because of Mormon Taggart because she believed that she'll be able to find a cure for him. But also we cannot forget that this new body we're seeing right now is not just Proteus. It's also piecemeal as well. And piecemeal was being abused by his mother, Harness. Oh, by the way, Harness is his mother. Fun fact right there. And so that is why she was so big on him getting all that power because she wanted to control that power as well for herself. Either way, she abused her son. And so both kids right now are crying out for help in the idea that they no longer want to be around. But here comes the problem though. Proteus is just too powerful for our heroes to kill off, which means they have to convince Proteus to actually kill himself to give him what he wants. The idea of finally being free to feel nothing. Now, for our heroes, they do realize that they do have more options than one. Like, yes, when it comes to Proteus, most likely the world is better off without him because how powerful he truly is. But at the same time, Proteus wants to feel nothing. We did have our heroes say, let's not forget that AIM had built a containment suit that could be used to give Proteus a new life in this world and give us a chance to show him a better life than he had the last time when he was around. A better life than what Mormon Tagger gave him. A better life than what Harness gave Piecemeal. Because again, Piecemeal and Proteus, they're combined into one. And technically right now, both mothers in their mind have done a horrible job. Now for me personally, I say Mormon Tagger did a bad job, yes, but not completely as bad as, you know, Piecemeal's mom, Harness. Either way, it's our hero saying, let's give Proteus the options for himself to choose. Like, we can't choose for him. It's up to him. But that's the problem, though. Proteus can't decide what he wants to do. And it all comes down to Mormon Taggart. Because she was able to talk to her son and say, listen, 
I understand that what you gone through in your past was horrible, but honestly, the best option for you to finally be happy again is to go ahead and kill yourself, commit suicide. And so with Proteus, he also realized that she is right. And so with that, we see Proteus die at the end of the story. Now, the very last page does show us who were the two characters in charge this entire time when it came to Kings of Pain. Now, the first one to me personally made sense. It was Gideon. Now, around this time in Marvel Comics, Gideon was still a very new character. We were still learning more about this character. But the other one, well, it's Toad. Now, for me personally, I didn't like the idea of Toad being this other mysterious character in the shadows. But I do understand why they use this character for. Because in the past, Toad was always used by other people for their own schemes. And so for the first time, it was time for Toad to be the one to use other people for his schemes. And so at the end of the book, is Toad saying that he loves the idea of being in charge, being able to being able to control other people for his own personal scheme. And so with that being said, this is where we are going to end today's comic book video. So please leave me a like down below and subscribe. But guys, see y'all next time. Later.